Ba, 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 ba. What's going on, everybody? We're here. We're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Live podcast. My name is Joey Ingram, one AK Chicago. Joey podcasts are officially on iTunes, and Jonah made me put them on SoundCloud, so they're on SoundCloud if you want to listen to them. Upcoming schedule for the week: we got Super High Roller Bowl week. We got Phil Hellmuth tomorrow, Mike McDonald on Thursday, Jason Kuhn Friday, and a fantasy draft on Saturday, where I'm probably going to lose money picking a awesome team. Joining me today on the podcast is a man I've been wanting to have on for a long time. I've heard a ton about him. He's got a very fun, great, sort of up, down, up, down, up, down poker story over many, many years. Been playing uh, cash games. And I know he's been more of a tournament guy, cash games, tournament player, sort of mixed uh, mixed in between here now for, I think, uh, maybe like past five, six, seven years. And uh, also entrepreneur too. Also a man known to wear a championship belt when he sometimes creates content, which you guys know we love championship belts around here on the podcast. We're joined by Matt Berkey. AKA, I guess you don't actually have any AKAs for me to say, man. It's just Matt Berkey, right? Yeah, yeah. Only in the uh, in the spoof video did I have an AKA with the what, championship belt. What's the AKA? I was the Dream Crusher. The Dream Crusher. Okay, we got the Dream Crusher, AKA Matt Berkey, in the house. I like the Dream Crusher, man. That's a pretty cool nickname. Yeah, it was kind of on the spot. I uh, I don't know. We just point, click, shoot, hope for the best. So, guys, today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about. Matt's new show that just came out. I don't know if actually officially out, but Poker Central announced their subscription service. Everyone's super excited to pay for it. I can tell social media is already already having a very fun time on there. But Matt's got a new show on there. It's called Dead Money, The Path to Super High Roller Bowl. And it goes over, I believe, his uh, his fifth place finish last year on the Super High Roller Bowl for $1.1 million. And we're also going to be discussing this upcoming Super High Roller Bowl here today. And we're going to discuss one of my favorite tweets in the history of Twitter that Matt made that I very much enjoy, and uh, all kind of other stuff, man. So, Matt, what, what do you feel like, for people out there that don't know much about you, Matt, what would kind of be your be your, your pitch to them? Say, oh, they, this is this explains me in a, a minute. Let's say a minute. Man. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess uh, I've quietly laid under the radar on purpose. Um, I'm not like... A huge fan of the spotlight in spite of the fact that like all this stuff is kind of coming out but as of late i just really felt like those of us that have been in the game for a really long period of time have seen the environment shift uh multiples of who knows how many and there's just a massive hole right now where content isn't good and i just felt like we we could do something pretty unique uh i have a pretty specific backstory that um you know, I'm pretty open about talking with where my mom suffered through addiction and we grew up insanely poor. So that's interesting. And I figured why not shine a light on it? So you mentioned that you think a lot of the content's bad. So when you say the bad content, do you mean training content? Because I know you have the Solve for Why Academy that, that focuses a lot on live training. Or do you mean sort of overall content in the poker industry? I guess I should have said bad. That's not very fair to everybody creating content. Like I do think there are a lot of good content creators out there, Doug being one of them. Um, I think that it's just been the same for a really long period of time. And we're still trying to do shit the same way we did in 2003. And whole cards aren't that interesting any longer. So like it's time to start cultivating characters. And there are enough of us that have survived the boom through Black Friday into this lull that we're in right now where uh, it's time to move on from the Mattisals and the Helmuths onto the next generation. I think that that falls on our shoulders to kind of carry the torch. Joining us tomorrow on the podcast, Phil Helmuth. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I definitely know what you mean. I think that, I mean, we're kind of getting right into this, but this is definitely a topic that I've thought a lot about. And I do feel like a lot of the content, it's sort of changing now with the new personalities coming on Twitch and the new personalities coming on YouTube. I do feel like that the most of the the people being pushed forward for many many years, uh, with all the ESPN coverage after that, were pretty much the same players. And a lot of those guys aren't necessarily poker players much anymore. They they just go on of other things. Whether they've been winning at poker anymore, who knows? And I, I do understand what you're saying that it probably is time for some of these new players who have these interesting stories to be brought to the forefront. And I guess from your perspective, what do you think is the type of impact that you can have on that in helping to create new stories or helping to get stories out there to the world? Well, I think just like kind of showing how much the platform has shifted, right? So it's not a scenario anymore. We're just being good at the game 
is going to have big companies and media banging down your door saying like, we want to talk about you in an open forum. Instead, it's like the technological shift has put us in a realm where we can kind of be the media company ourselves. It's really so different from like when Negreanu and Helmuth and all those guys were coming up where they created who they were and their personalities and, and things like that through simple networking with people who had the ability to give them a voice. For us, the platform's there. We all have voices that are self-created through social media, through Twitch, through YouTube, whatever. Um, and it's a matter of just like capitalizing on it, having good creative ideas that people are going to be interested in tuning into, and then actually implementing it. And that's hard. A lot of people just don't want to put the work in. So it kind of really does set uh, an industry standard for those who are willing to grind are going to rise. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, kind of you mentioned on that. I think also, in a lot of ways, it does matter if you are good at poker. I mean, obviously, there's sure. people now who are, who are popular who are, you know, not really good at poker. They didn't necessarily work hard to get at poker. They, you know, whatever. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to bang bang on anybody today. But I do think that a lot of people that are good at poker right now that could be creating really good content that are some of the more creative people or smarter people are still focused on playing poker. And yeah. when they are done maybe focused on playing poker, they want to do something else because I think a lot of it comes down to how much money can you make. And right. in terms of all this type of stuff, it's more of a long-term thing. And even then, you're not really going to make a ton of money unless you unless you really, really grind or build a company or build a big product. And I think a lot of people who are used to making a lot of money at poker probably just want to get into something else. And they don't necessarily want to put that same grind in with the content game and with all this stuff. So I can certainly understand why a lot more people who maybe are really good at the game don't decide to get into this type of stuff. Yeah, sure. And I'm not saying it's for everybody. I'm just saying that before it was kind of defaulted that like you got good and then somebody else did all the work for you. Right. Where now it's kind of defaulted that if anybody's going to care, you're already good. There are a lot of people who are good. Now it's the subset of people that are good who are willing to take the next step and kind of create a brand for themselves and, and put themselves out there. Really like, you know, transparency is so incredibly important. And it's what this industry greatly lacks. Uh, it's still considered to be this like seedy handshake deal type industry where nobody really knows what exactly what's going on behind closed doors. Nobody knows how big of a piece people have of one another and, and all the inner workings of the business. That stuff's interesting. Like Shark Tank, when pitched, was probably a super boring idea. But it's an incredibly interesting show because it provides those gaps in knowledge that the average person possesses an inside look. I'm, I'm reading one of the comments that, that caught my eye and, and it, it made me laugh. So, But I think you make up a good point about that. And I mean, it makes sense why it's not as transparent in poker because, I mean, no one will talk about how much money they've been losing. Very few people want to talk about how much money they've been losing. I think, I, I know, you know, you're very open with your story over time. And me, I was always really open with, with sort of what was happening with me in poker through my blog and through posting on 2 Plus 2. And I would always share when I'd have a winning session, I would share that, a big winning session. When I had a massive losing session, when I would lose 52 buy-ins in a day, I would post about that. And I would always try to share the ups and the downs. And when I felt like wanting to fucking die, I would post about that. And, you know, sometimes maybe two plus two moderators might call me up and say, hey, you know, are you, you're okay. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm fucking losing my fucking mind here. I'm playing poker all day long and going through these ups and downs. And I do think a lot of that isn't necessarily told much anymore. Now it's just, you know, it's really focused on the glamorous type of stuff for the most part, I feel like with with all the tournament scores and all these, you know, all the cash games, all the products out there, all the courses out there. It seems like everything's sort of just geared towards there. And a lot of the story isn't really being told. And it's because it paints poker in a negative way. A lot of people say that I talk to. Therefore, a lot of people don't want to feature that part of the poker world. But I do think it is a very, very interesting part of what happens well, in the game. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of unfair to just project that it paints poker in a negative light like it just paints it in a true light if there are negative aspects to that so be it there's a ton of positive as well um you know i think there's been really good content sporadically over the last decade like all the things that you mentioned that you used to do well that's probably why you have an award-winning podcast now <laughs> you know like that's how you get to this point and uh, i don't know how familiar you are with matt moore but he used to have a blog called another kid another dream and it detailed his transition from college and wanting to be a reporter to 
or, or a writer or something along those lines to mm -hmm. rising through the stakes. It was basically very similar to what Andrew Nimi is doing now, only in, in actual longhand form. And he's an amazing writer. And it's like, this might've been a hundred thousand words over the course of two or three years. And I read every one. It was, it was just compelling to see him go from like two, five to 50, a hundred plus and, and, you know, backing in tournaments and things like that. That stuff is incredibly interesting. It lends itself to mainstream media. Like screenplays can be written about this to now where we're not just dealing with the bullshitty runner runner type stuff where, you know, it's just this, I don't know very much about this world other than the shallow, uh, perception of it. So let's just try to paint that picture for the masses to, to follow. And instead you humanize it. And it's like, this is legit. This, this is what a lot of these kids went through where they forewent higher education or, you know, wall street jobs, or, uh, you know, we have a lot of engineers and, and computer scientists, things like that. People are passing on these realms to follow this dream. And I think that that can be done in a really compelling way. So what's your, I guess, do you have something potentially in the works in terms of what that might look like that you can directly contribute to? Or is this something that you are sort of wanting to put out there to the world and maybe hope that people who are creating content or people who work with some of the companies like a Poker Central are listening and then they might, I guess, work on ideas like that in the future? I guess both, right? Like, um, it's always good to be first to market in something, but it's always better to have an established market once you are. So I would certainly, as a consumer, like to see uh, a lot of the content shift this way. I would love to see, you know, more broad scale applications like TV shows or, or Hollywood or whatever getting involved. Um, me personally, it's like, I'm just throwing a ton of darts at a board and seeing which one sticks. Like we're constantly going down the rabbit hole of content creation. Um, we're just like shooting all summer and then figuring out what the project's going to be after the fact, just mm -hmm. hoping like, you know, somebody makes a deep run or that nobody makes a deep run and somehow that's compelling as well. But, you know, like with the dead money project, we, we had all the footage shot prior to even pitching poker central. We had no idea where it was going to live. We just knew we wanted to do it. And once they gave us the green light to shoot like behind the scenes of super high roller ball, it's like, okay, let's just do it. Let's hope they like it and buy it. And if they don't, somebody will, will be interested because we think we can do this well. It's pretty cool that you've had this for so long and then you sort of held on to it, didn't put it out there. And then you worked out some with poker central. And I know we talked about this briefly before we got on, but it's sort of been in the works for a long time. And now finally, May 22nd, of 2017, a week before this year's Super High Roller Bowl. Now, so is the show officially out right now? Is it out yeah. for people to watch or is it coming yeah. out? No, it's out. It's on Poker Go. Um, so anybody who wants it can just head to Poker Go, uh, subscribe. If you use the code S4Y, uh -oh. uh, you you get ten dollars off. Uh oh. So take it for what it's worth. <laughs> I like it, man. I can't wait for the uh, I can't wait for the swarm of affiliate coach to come up Poker Central. I know I'm gonna have one shot to my boy Sam Simmons for doing that. Yeah. So what what do you what do we think about this poker go right? So it's nine ninety nine. If you haven't seen it, it's nine ninety nine a month. People out there and uh, Super High Roller Bowl is gonna be on there. I believe the World Series of Poker. Most of the coverage is not ESP not on ESPN live stream down there for the main event. Will be on there as well. I don't know specifics of that. And I think I read that. And we just had Maurice Kandani on the podcast. He talked about how there's a lot of really good high stakes cash games coverage coming very soon. And this, I'm pretty sure what he was alluding to, it'll be on this app. And then I think it's uh, $99 for one year. You get a little discount for that. So what do you think about this, Matt? What do you think about this uh, this shift in, in the poker world? Because we haven't really seen this before ever in poker. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not privy enough to the business side to know how successful the model is. I know that it's done well with other uh, metrics like MLB, NBA, NFL, uh, UFC fight pass, stuff like that. They've had a ton of success with it. I don't know necessarily know what the demand is for poker, but I know that the content is going to be really good. Um, I actually did a test for one of the big cash games that Maury was alluding to, and it went really well. It's interesting. It's it's going to be a lot more reminiscent to like the good old days of high stakes poker, where there's a lot of money changing hands, there are interesting characters, and I think like Maury more than anybody else gets it, like just talking with him after the test run was done and things things like that. It's like he knows the focus is more on 
the people that are playing rather than the money exchanging hands. And personally, I think that's where like the promises Poker Night in America made three or four years ago when they launched, uh, they came up insanely short. And I've been really vocal about it just because, you know, pretty much from day one, I've been exchanging uh, information back and forth with them. And I just feel like they never, ever, ever came even remotely close to living up to what they, they promised they were going to try to do, which I thought was a great idea. Yeah, I remember I just actually read what you put out there before we started the podcast. And I had uh, Tad Todd Anderson on, I think it was the week before the show officially aired. I had him on a podcast too when I first started. But I can't believe I've been doing a podcast this long. It's pretty crazy to think about. But I remember we did talk about that. He talked about really having it be a show that featured the players, broke, talked about more players' stories, sort of really made these poker players into characters. And some of them we would know, some of them we might meet then, but they might have been known in poker and then sort of build a, that uh, build on that along the way. And I do think that, you know, they sort of shifted away from that and now it looks a lot different. And uh, I do believe Maury, I, I mean, I just had more on the pod, obviously. He's one of my, I mean, I, he tells such great stories. The way he talks about poker, you can tell he really, really, really just loves it. He's really all about it. And we watched High Stakes Poker Season 4 last night episode 10, 11, 12, the uh, 500K episodes. And those are just such great television. The players are all, it's just such a fun game. And I mean, it's just such good stuff. And if there's definitely a way to bring that back, I think it would be very good for Poker Go. I think that would make it success. I think yeah. people are going to be turned off to paying. Not, they're going to like, what the fuck? You know, I, now we got to pay for poker. We got all this free stuff on Twitch. We got all this free stuff on YouTube. Why am I going to want to pay for poker? And I think with Swear Rollerball, they're doing a good job by launching it with this with this first big event, sort of like WWE did with WrestleMania. And I ultimately think that it will be it will be very successful because I do believe that the content is going to be very strong. Yeah, that's that's really what it boils down to, right? It's like, yeah, there's a ton of free stuff out there, but the quality of content that they're putting out is just going to be head and shoulders above most of what you're going to get for free. And I think they recognize that too, right? Like they understand that this is going to be an industry driven uh, type of thing. So my anticipation at least isn't that they're just going to rely on uh, a couple of ambassadors that they have. Like, you know, we've seen so many companies in the past just sign up Antonio or Dnegs and, and just jam them down your throat. And it's like, well, if you don't like these two guys, we're not for you. And uh, at least as I've talked with Poker Central a ton, obviously, uh, and the conversation seems to be very much a heavy investment in the community and trying to shine a, a positive spotlight on, you know, the players that are are building this thing out from from within, the guys who have been staples for a long period of the game that are relative unknowns. When I say relative unknowns, I mean like, you know, not household names. Who do you think some of those people are when you think about who might not be these household names right now? And I guess when you consider household, if we go mainstream, there really aren't too many. That's They're what I'm outside saying. of the, the you know the older school guys. I guess it's kind of an interesting idea. An interesting sort of thought is who aren't the who are the guys who are maybe on that cusp? Who are the guys that with some push and with some more coverage and with some more? I mean, it was just so easy with ESPN back in the day yeah. because you had every event streamed. They always showed the same the same faces, same people. They were always you know going deep in some of these tournaments. You stack that with full tilt poker. You stack that with poker stars and high stakes poker, poker superstars, poker after dark, all this stuff. It's like you can't not pay attention to these guys because they're in your face everywhere. Whereas now, you know, they didn't necessarily exist that quite like that to become a household name. So, right. you know, it is it is pretty challenging to really take someone and then turn them into something in this day, unless it's like a William Kasuf or <laughs> shout out to William Kasuf, the, the most popular poker player in the world for a period of time. I don't quite know if he can say that anymore. But yeah, I think it's hard to really take some guys unless they seek it out themselves and really hard to turn them into someone that is more household a name but at the same time it's like really easy like and, and what i mean by that is uh when you pay attention to like the youtube stars and how quickly they rise uh you know almost everybody knows who jenna marbles is uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people know who don mazzetti is and it's just that easy from a poker standpoint too so if poker central truly is invested in the players in the community when you're asking like who's on the cusp it's everybody right like Everybody who's not Negranu, Seidel, Helmuth is on the cusp. Like Phil Gelfond is no more of a household name than you or I. And that's a problem because Phil's really, really accomplished, right? Mm -hmm. So if he 
and Poker Central work together, he very easily does become that household name just just through branding, just through uh, the amount of viral media that's available. So uh, you did reveal, so you are a bro science guy, of course. Now it makes sense how you have some of the biggest, <laughs> ar the biggest arms and biggest legs in poker. Now it makes more sense, man. I Now I know what you've been watching to, to, to help achieve these, these massive gains that you got going on over there, first man, of all. He and, is so uh, enjoyable. <laughs> uh, some of you aren't going to get that, but it's a YouTube channel. One of the guys he mentioned does all these bro science videos, and they're, they're very funny. I would encourage you guys to check them out. If you work out or if you know we're talking, we life, could turn you know? Dentali into like the next superstar if uh, if we just follow him around with a camera for a year. The people are there's going to be some people watching this. They're going to get mad. I, I I support this idea, <laughs> but I mean it could be something. It certainly would be entertaining, right? I mean, I mean Mazzetti's writing these scripts. He just lives it. You know, it's like we could turn him into Bro Science 2.0 and just like put this guy out of business. <laughs> Well, I'm sure Dentali would be all for that, man. He gets to get his yeah. name out there a little bit more. He gets to rock the tank tops all the time. Yeah. He gets to show up with the tan all the time. So I think that'd be something he'd probably enjoy. If um, I, mean, I think in that situation, though, you really have to seek that out. You have to sort of be awesome. all in on this idea of turning into someone. And even if you're working with another company, you still have to be all in on the idea and be willing to give that yeah. much. I mean, the big thing is... In your life. The big thing is that it's going to start from the macro to the micro. So like Ooh. if if you just compare it to a lot of other niche industries, there's a show on Discovery that's been around for 10 years now about crab fishing. And it's like, I don't know any of the characters from season one or season two, but if I were a devout follower of the show, I would. And the whole point is that there's a spotlight on crab fishing, on Amish mafias, and on uh, you know guys who run distilled whiskey in the South. Like these niche markets exist, and developing the characters after the fact is really just a byproduct, and it's beneficial to us in the community. I mean, it sounds like Poker Central does have a lot of big ideas in the in store, or just ideas in general. And I guess it does hurt that, you know, cause I think something earlier you mentioned was, and it kind of, it was an idea, but it, it brought something else to my mind, which is that, you know, you mentioned Phil Galfon maybe being a bigger household name. And I think what happens often is that, you know, Phil Galfon now has one, he has a, a training site. So he's competing against other training sites out there. So therefore, you know, the desire to maybe share anything related to Phil Galfon or talk about him is not going to be there from certain people. And sure. now if he's starting a poker site, well, now that's even bigger. So you're going to have some media sites that work with poker stars that aren't going to want to promote Phil Galfon and run at once and maybe build him into something because of their relationship with poker stars. Poker stars might say, hey, don't do this, don't do that. You know, it could be like that way with Poker Central. So I think oftentimes that's what you run into is that people just don't want to promote anyone else. And especially now everyone's got a product, everyone's got something that mm -hmm. they don't want to lose their business and they don't want to give attention to the competition I think that is a pretty big thing in poker that does exist is that and that's I think it's a big reason why you don't see certain people get maybe more coverage on poker news or other media sites is because it's just it's not necessarily optimal for them and for the people they have relationships with. And yeah, I mean, I do think that's a big thing in poker. and I'm not sure how that can get fixed as it currently is set up. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the hopes are that Poker Central kind of becomes that universal hub where they're bigger than just like um, inside the community type relationships. Like if they scale to the level that they're planning on, their sponsors are going to be Budweiser and Amazon and, and you know, mm -hmm. actual large corporations not have to worry about like having handshake deals with other poker related products. A big shout out to Amazon. The guys who uh, work with Poker Central from Amazon are some crazy Motherfuckers, man. Shout out to them. They know who they are <laughs> out there. Shout out to Jeff. Uh, people in the chat here, we're tuning in live. Link, I, we're getting a lot of good questions out there. Good comments out there. I think, uh, shout out to Natalia. Oh my God, we got a woman in here. Listen, man, Berkey, I don't know what your demo is over for what you guys are doing, but our demo now, a lot of men, man. A lot of men. Now you need, it's growing. It's even growing more men. 98% men, 2% women. So it used to be three and now it's, now it's even worse. So You'd be shocked how many women apply and attend the academy. We've had 50 attendees over the last 18 months, and I think we've had 15 women, which is like pretty strong. 
we will are we are announcing the official Poker Life Academy will be coming to Las Vegas starting <laughs> October 21st. Joey Ingram, myself, will be starting this. And no, I'm kidding. But we talk about the academy. So the academy sell for why. I, I know one person who has taken the academy, heard really great things. So congratulations on putting something like that together that yes. people are taking and then really taking a lot away from. I think that is really, really awesome. So why don't you tell people a little bit more about what exactly it is and what exactly the hope and the goal of, of building this is? Sure, so uh, how it exists in its current state is it's, uh, it, it's basically a poker training academy where we're trying to shift the way that we problem solve from figuring out the how and the what and instead treating it from a Y centric point of view. So basically like the common way of solving a problem is to identify it and then find the most readily available solution. But with us being an advanced society now and having a lot of technology available, often the most optimal solution is preferred to the fastest solution. So basically by scaling back and approaching problems from like, why does this exist to begin with? We're able to kind of backtrack and see the small micro problems along the way that are much more solvable than the big macro. So the example I always use is a lot of people come in and they say, I'm just getting check raised on the river too much and I don't know how to defend against it. It's like, okay, well, let's let's figure out why you're getting check raised so much. And we find out that they're C betting too often on the flop and checking too many turns. So therefore they're like very capped by the time they arrive at the river. And it's like, now we can scale back and we can adjust your frequencies along the way to the point where now you're a lot more balanced when you arrive at the river and you don't face this kind of uh, offhand aggression. Um, so we basically took this and we created a three-day academy out of it where uh, we we do like theoretical talk and approach it from a very macro sense. Uh, we spend like four or five hours a day teaching and then the students play for three hours on an RFID table while the coaches and myself commentate over top of it. That's their study tool when they get to leave. Um, and, you know, from there, we create like an actual follow up learning path where we have uh, a webinar series for them to uh, kind of delve into where we get into more of the micro learning, where we talk a lot of specifics like ranges and and what your frequency should actually look like, things along those lines. Um, one on one coaching uh, and people can like follow up and reattend the academy as, as an observer because it's a lot of dense material. But the real big picture why I did this was it was just kind of a proof of concept. Um, I want to grow the brand like far beyond poker, but it's like, you know, you start with what you know first mm -hmm. and pro prove that it can be successful. Uh, I want to transition into it being more like lifestyle oriented um, because I think there are a lot of areas where we're just not really, we're not taught very well growing up. And we we arrive in adulthood with these massive gaps in knowledge um my partner christian soto is a perfect example he uh he was you know I, I see pictures of him when he was a kid like 21 22 years old he was in good shape he was athletic and he's kind of let himself go through the poker lifestyle now he like walks into a gym and he's just intimidated and doesn't know where to begin and that's a lack of education right if he just had the knowledge of how to work out he'd get in there and crush it because he's determined he has the drive He's just scared because he lacks the knowledge. And that's a gap that I feel like we can fill. Nutrition as well is like, so we want to shift that way. And then ultimately I just want to uh, get to the level of altruism. I have an idea of creating a uh, like community center um, where kids exchange uh, functional education hours for their after school activities. So like basically partner with all the little leagues, the Pop Warner footballs, the, the dance teams, everything where it's all under one roof and these kids will exchange like an hour in a logic class in exchange for uh you know a week on a baseball team so i mean those obviously are, are huge ideas right there and you're still playing a lot of poker as well too so how do you find the you know the balance and i guess approaching all this because you mentioned that you know you, you start with what you know and i definitely agree with that it's certainly something i've sort of came to over these past eight months since I've been doing more. I started something called GTO Club, which is like a very similar concept of just helping people learn things that you don't really learn growing up and putting people yeah. together as a, as a team. But then when you're still trying to stay at a high level of poker, you're still trying to compete and you're, you're all, now you want to maybe move outside of poker and maybe move into some of these other things. 
it just seems like it'd be very sort of tough to to balance that and then just sacrifice okay maybe i'm just not going to be as good at poker anymore and therefore i'm probably going to either not make as much or i'm going to lose more money at poker because i'm pursuing this i think for myself that's the biggest thing to deal with it's just like all right like you know when where do i draw the line and for myself i just really stopped playing poker for a period of time because i didn't know any other way to do it yeah. now, i think for, for, when you think about it for yourself how are you going to approach doing that well, all right, so I've already been doing it for like a year and a half, but I think the big difference is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you largely come from an online background, right? Yeah, online. Okay, so like, what was your general hourly uh, input a year? Like, how many hours did you usually play a year? <laughs> Fuck, man, I don't know, a lot. <laughs> Most, almost, almost every day, it seems like. I think almost every day for, I mean, outside of traveling and stuff like that, almost every day for probably nine, nine years, something like okay, that. Okay, so in my... 14 years of playing my highest volume year was the year that I played online tournaments for like five months and I was at like 1400 hours. That's my biggest volume year. So like I'm used to playing 500 to a thousand hours a year. Mm. And now that I'm playing as big as I am, uh, the games just don't run that much. So I'm okay with my, my volume played being very low. I just, I'm in the lab always like my Google drive folder is just it's a one rabbit hole after the other and I love it like I so much enjoy the creative process um, that it's easy it's not work to me so I probably put in 2000 hours a year now between the business and poker but it's not a fair split I might only be putting in like 500 towards poker what's in the what's in the drive what do you got in there right now man um, I mean I started it in 2013 or sorry, no, 2012 when I went broke and the, the like top tier first surface folders are just like the self-actualizing process. Just a ton of like when I was suffering and figuring out like what the hell I was going to do with my life, just laying on the couch, trying to figure out if it was time to get a job or not. Um, it was just like scratching the surface of, of asking yourself all those tough questions. And from there, it began to like branch one way in strategy construction and then another way in content creation and then uh, just another way in these like grandiose ideas of of developing this like community center. So, I mean, it's it's deep. It's <laughs> we, we joked about like uh, what I would sell it for. And I said if if it would depend on the number of eyeballs that were on it, like if it was just one person, I'd sell it cheap. Like maybe ten thousand dollars but if it was like a hundred thousand people then i'd probably have to sell it for like ten thousand per person just because it would shift it would shift the way i was approached both in poker and life like pretty dramatically and it would it would take away of a lot of a lot of whatever edge i possess so i think from from sort of just knowing about your play style and from what you've said so far during this conversation i think that you have probably created a lot of efficient strategies that most people might perceive as inefficient when you're playing poker. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm definitely not under the umbrella of what is commonly thought to be GTO now. Um, but I also am not really of the mindset that we've properly identified what GTO is. Like when I say that, I don't mean in a theoretical sense. Obviously, we all understand the game theory is a thing and that there is a certain path to to the solve. But I think that we've kind of taken that term and ran with it as a community and it's just getting bastardized into a style almost. Yes. And it's, it's really painful for me on the outside looking in to, to hear people throw around the term GTO and then just equate it to a defensive style. I think that as more computing takes place, what we're actually going to see is this whole other side of the game tree that's being unexplored right now that's going to quantify people like Ivy and Isildur and Durr. And it's basically going to show quantifiable metrics as to what the method to their madness was. Mm. So like things that we think are highly exploitative now are possibly just a whole nother branch of the game tree that lead to the same solve. Oh, people in chat are saying, um, are talking about me. So I think I start. I think I'm definitely one of the people who has everyone saying GTO and not even a poker sense. Cause I use GTO all the time, but yeah, it doesn't sure. mean anything. I've turned in different words. So my thinking was years ago when I started doing this was I kept hearing all the fucking, 
all these like guys, oh my God, I'm so GTO. And they say all this fucking shit. It was like their, their nerdy way to say, I'm so much fucking cooler than you. I'm yeah. so good at poker. I'm this, I'm that. You know, I, I said, you know what? When I was out to dinner with uh, Odd Odson and Isel Drew and this, the, the PLO guys, we were out at the win and they're like, oh, this order is very GTO, Joe. You need to get all this, all this seafood. You need to put it on the table. You need to get this. This is GTO. I said, what are you fucking saying? What are you guys saying? What do you mean GTO? What do you mean? They're like, they're like, no, this is GTO. Get it? And I said, I said, I, I get it. So ever since then, I've, I've said, I'm going to turn this term into something that those people cannot use anymore to sound so smart. And it's been my main mission. Well, it's actually not true. It's been one of my missions to make that happen and take GTO into mainstream so that everyone uses it. And therefore, those people cannot use it in that way anymore. And my mission has been successful. Dare it I has. say GTO? That's very true. But I mean, I use GTO all the time. Like I'll, I, now I just use it. I, I obviously use it way too much. And I'm perfectly fine with that because it's a great word, man. I don't know. GTO, it's such a great, not even a word, I suppose. It's just like a saying, but to me, it's just optimal. Like, and it's not even what's really optimal. Like this hat, just a GTO hat, which, you know, probably not, but it's like a subjective thing for me. I think it's GTO. So that's yeah, yeah. change the definition. That's and, uh, fine. It's, it's the guys, and there's a lot of them who use the term to uh, present superiority, where it's <laughs> like, this is how I'm right and you're wrong. And it falls under this umbrella of theory. And since theory is not proven, there's no real argument against. So what would you say to some guys, maybe like a Doug, when he starts talking about all the GTO plays and situations? I think he's developed a, an incredibly strong strategy. He's one of the best for a reason. I don't think it's the only strategy. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of counters to it. And I think I personally play pretty well against GTO stylish players i also think that like you know he's a pretty unique subset like guys like him sauce and a handful of others are the best at that and everybody else trying to emulate them are making a massive massive mistakes along the way so the assumptions that doug's making throughout the course of a hand are way more crisp and precise than <laughs> joe smith who's trying to emulate him this is uh, this uh, some of the most strategy has just been dropped on the podcast right now, guys. Because and this is what I find when I work with PLO guys is that they're always talking about Phil Galfon stuff and saying like, man, and they're playing like fifty cent dollar online on stars and they're saying, yeah, I need to be I need to be GTO in this spot, I need to be bam. I'm like, man, fuck, what is Phil Galfon doing out there to people, man? What is what like what Galfon is, is the first to tell you that that's not a thing. Like he'll be the first to tell you that the way he problem solves is just logically deducing the information that's being presented to him. And that's why I think he's like one of the best because he's that hybrid be between like the online GTO exposure where they're in the lab and they're running all the solvers and you know the highest stakes live games where it's just like I can look this guy in the face and just understand that this one time he's deviated and now my hand goes from a fold to a call. Right. So what do you think's happening with I mean, obviously, Doug now has, I mean, I don't know how many millions of views on his videos now. And he pretty much always sort of, I wouldn't say preaches, but talks this style. This is what, and I, I mean, I don't think you can talk to so many Nolan Holm players now who don't say they don't watch Doug's videos. So yeah. they're picking up all this information and they're sort of thinking, okay, this is how I should approach this. But do you feel like there's, I, I, mean, I think there's anytime there's strategy, there's going to be people misapplying it, no matter what strategy it is, whether it's this sure. strat, that strat. So I would imagine that's, certainly happening in this scenario but do you think it's any worse than potentially trying to emulate a strategy they might read in a book where they misapply that strat um probably because it's in its in its truest form it's a better strategy than like what they're reading in a book so like they can reach the ceiling of what the book is trying to teach them in most instances where in this instance they'll just get caught in the infinite learning loop because doug's always going to be crisper and no more so every time uh, they feel like they reach a barrier. He can just kind of point and say like, oh, well, you, you're you missing this aspect and just run them back through the loop. I think it's a fantastic business model. I think it's amazing for the community um, in the sense that it'll freeze, it'll freeze the growth for a little while, uh, kind of like Black Friday did, which if you're a profitable poker player, that's the best thing you could ever ask for. I think because it's a defensive strategy, it's going to glorify bluff catching again, which, you know, that 08 to 2011 time period was just like one of the best uh, small small time frames if you're an aggressive, laggy player. Um, so, yeah, for me personally, I love it. 
Um, I think the reason why it's so damn popular is because it it preys upon two things that people are susceptible to: risk aversion. So he presents them with a defensive style, which and I shouldn't say Doug. It's not just Doug, obviously. That's not fair. But that that camp presents a defensive style, and it's a dependent learning path. So they just continually go back to um, the the source for for more information. People can only go as far as the solvers will take them, and their assumptions will allow them to go. And anytime that they reach a brick wall, it's basically because they can point and say their assumptions were wrong. So they go back to the guru and say, teach me how to assume better. Uh, a lot of like what we're trying to do is get away from that. So if you if you attend an academy, it's it's very abstract. We're getting away from linear thought. We're not talking hand histories. We're talking like holistic strategy. Uh, and we really want to empower the, the attendees to be independent in their learning process and not ask us for permission to um, to think a certain way or to arrive at certain conclusions or to assume certain things. Like when they ask me what I would do with this hand given this action, it's like, I don't know. I'm not in your game. Like you're in this game. It's live. You know these people. This is your player pool. Like you decide. And once you make that decision, now let's build around it and, and find the path to a conclusion. Um, and I think that this is what our education system greatly lacks and why there's such a need for this after school thing that I'm trying to develop because, you know, we don't teach logic anymore. We don't teach how to finance a car or a house or mortgage or, you know, these practical applications to fundamental knowledge. Instead, we just teach memorization. It's a dependent learning path. We always have to go back to the educator and say, am I doing this right? So can you give me an example of what you mean by, so you said a holistic strategy, uh, just that, that idea. Can you give me an example of people out there, sort of what exactly you might mean by that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I guess like the general way that people come to us is they're used to digesting information in small micro bites. So if somebody limps, I should treat it as if the limp doesn't exist and just raise accordingly. Um, moreover, if somebody limps, then they're weak. So now I should be widening my range. And what we're saying is forget about the limper for a second. What's your strategy in middle position with this subset of hands? And, you know, it's, it's going to be to raise. Okay. Do you have this subset of hands? Yes. Okay. Is there a limper? Yes. Now that we've accumulated all of this information, Let's digest what the proper adjustment should be from our general strategy that already exists, right? So now we have we have an, uh, a general strategy that we can always implement. And as more information is fed to us, we can just shift or deviate one way or the other, depending on what that information is. So that's why I always defer back to them and say, like, I don't know this guy that limped. You do. What are his tendencies? What are his frequencies? How often does he limp, et cetera? So should you widen your your opening range here, should you keep it the same? Should you tighten? Should you limp back? These are all decisions that you're going to have to make. And they're a part of a more overall strategy once you start thinking ahead as well. Like if I do A, B, or C, then how does the flop play? How does the turn play? How does the river play? So like when we get into post-flop discussion, we, we discuss board textures and we group them. And then we start to plan from all the turns and rivers that can run off backwards. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is a GTO concept. And, and that's why I, I don't want to slam the style because the actual theory behind uh, a lot of what goes on is very, very, very useful and applicable and a part of, you know, being a good poker player. So this is exactly the way I think about Popman Omaha. And this is what I, when I work with people, that's why I try to, when they're like, what should I do? I try, I tell them how I think hmm. and how I've like just learned over the years and sort of what I've come to. I talk about it sort of being in my mind, but I have absolutely no idea how I would ever teach anyone any of this stuff because you, what you just said basically is i mean you know we learn over time to maybe understand an opponent's tendencies we understand his frequencies we understand what this guy is limping with almost like precisely oftentimes yeah. in a lot of spots and that comes with time that comes from that comes from isolating his rays a bunch of times it just come isolating a player type like him seeing what happens getting to showdown and that just sometimes takes months it takes years and that's how we learn to get better at identifying what that player has in that specific situation and then how we should adjust our strategies against that 
But in terms of teaching that, I mean, I, I like put some thought, I, I don't even like, it's just, it's, and it's so far the other side of what is traditionally taught. I think in a lot of poker, you know, a lot of poker theory, a lot of poker videos and training sites. So how do you help someone get better at identifying frequencies and tendencies in that situation when a lot of that just comes from simply volume, 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 and then deducing what you just saw and then putting into your mind and oftentimes it's going to be wrong for a long period of time too. Yeah. Uh, so like, I think it, it almost has nothing to do with poker mostly. So I work very closely with Elliot Rowe and I've been working a lot with Nick Howard lately. Uh, and he and I are on very similar paths. We think very similarly and we bounce a lot of ideas off of each other. Um, one of the big things that we've been discussing is this independent learning path and how to get people to buy into it because it's scary. And that's like where Elliot and, and removing yourself kind of comes in until you're able to start to objectively consume the information being presented to you, this will fail because it's just too easy to employ your bias onto the next action, right? Like I looked at this guy, he's terrible. He's the worst. I'm just going to ISO seven, four suited. <laughs> And it's just like, yeah, that's that's how I started playing too. I had a lot of piss and vinegar running through my veins, and and you know, I just wanted to blow everybody out every single pot. Um, but I've been able to construct that now and rein it in and, and create a strategy. Um, I I went through the same challenge. Like the reason why it took so long to get to this point of actually doing an academy is it because I didn't have the idea? I had the idea way back in 2012 when I was working with Jason Somerville, helping Russ Thomas train for the final table. I was like, this is great. Like, if we can find a way to make this like an immersion style training, this will go really well. But I had no idea how to transfer the knowledge. Um, and it's really about scaling way, way, way out, getting away from the specifics and getting to the root of the true issues. People are afraid to fail. People are afraid to be wrong. People uh, are looking for permission to take certain actions. The reason why hand histories are discussed, it's such great volume and detail and length is because at the end of the the details, all anybody's looking for is confirmation that they they played it correctly and that you would do the same. Nobody's looking for any sort of like honest criticism or anything along those lines. They're just looking to further their own biases. And that's kind of really what we're teaching is to remove yourself from that and to begin trying to alleviate as much of these biases as possible and think objectively. So what do you think is a good suggestion out there for people who don't do this or can't do this, who don't even understand what the hell you just said, basically, how would you <laughs> recommend they even what's like, what's something they can actually maybe take away and potentially start thinking about or implementing, I guess, yeah. right now? I would say dive into a subject material that you know nothing about, but you're somewhat interested in because it'll force you to sift through the bullshit that I mean, that's kind of like how I learned, right, was nutrition. It was something that fascinated me. I wanted to get in the best shape of my life. And I knew that nutrition was an issue. And I also knew that it was a young science where it was ever changing. You know, when I was in college, it was like uh, eating fat was really bad for you. And now I know a lot more about the science. It's like, I don't know how I even survived. All I lived on were carbs. Um, but getting out there and researching stuff, when you find something, then search the opposite side and see how conflicting it is, then research your sources. It's difficult, man. It's it's not an easy route to go down, but it's a good way to start training your brain. Start finding sources that you trust and you believe in. Um, people like Tim Ferriss do the hard work for you. You know, he he gets out there and he tries to give you as much of an objective view as you can as he can without like uh, you know, kind of caving in on on the things that he believes in. Uh, there's a blogger, her name's Denise Minger. Um, she literally just writes objective research pieces on a lot of the stuff that's out there uh, and dissects, you know, the biases that that they're written behind. Things like, if you're familiar with the documentary Forks Over Knives, it, it had a, a big push when people were uh, looking to get into the vegetarian movement um, and be anti-animal products. She just objectively researched it. She was a former vegan herself and basically dispelled the whole thing. Same thing with the China study, et cetera. So there are people out there doing the, the, the hard work for you. You just kind of have to uncover them. And once you can kind of get your brain trained that way, it's a lot easier to then enter a poker hand and say like, okay, I think this guy sucks, but why? What, what about this guy quantifiably says that he sucks? 
And if he does suck, how am I taking advantage of it by raising 7-4? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff is just... I wonder, I guess I wish there was a way to sort of track how much, like what what retains with people. So if you, I think when you put these guys in a three-day course, I think they're going to take away a ton, especially the more, I guess it's the smarter they are, the more they, they can take in information. I think the more they're going to learn in that spot. Just like, I mean, I guess you could say that about a lot of things, but I feel like this idea is something that takes months, even, I mean, yeah. fucking years for a lot of people to really let this stuff sink in and really have it start impacting the way that they then play poker and then live life. And so I guess we did talk about this beforehand and you mentioned outside of what happens after the course, but then, you know, what do you do for a lot of those guys afterwards when now they're trying to implement it and they're failing and then, you know, they, they, they're just like, fuck this, I don't know if I can do this. And then they start taking another poker information and they're like, well, this says this, well, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do this. You know, what's sort of the way to keep those guys up to speed and keep them, I guess, in that sort of community where they're still thinking with the same mindset? Yeah, so I mean, to be clear, in the three days, it's literally two days of them motherfucking me, telling me I'm not teaching them anything. <laughs> and then the third day of like everything kind of coming together and they're like, uh, I get it now. Um, and the reason being is because the first two days are literally just abstract theory. Like it's just a lot of abstract stuff where we don't give them any details to cling to. It's just reconditioning the way they think as best we can, right? And then day three, we actually get into like flop textures and some frequencies. And now we're into the micro learning side of things. And they're right back to what they what they recognize, what, what they're used to consuming. And they love it. Now all of a sudden everything makes sense, right? So people often leave understanding it was dense material, but feeling like it all makes sense. And, and some of those guys never, never get it, right? Like they just think that that's it. They're great now and they're gonna move on. Most people understand that they just have a glimpse now at a very wide path moving forward. And we try to be as much of a guiding light as possible without being a crutch. So um, basically, like the way I try to explain it to people is that poker is one of those games where, or Texas Hold'em in particular, is it's an easy game to learn. It's an impossible game to master, right? We've all heard the cliche. Um, but what that really means is that the barrier of entry to play the game is incredibly low. Anybody can pick up the rules, figure out what beats what, and go play in a 25 cent, 50 cent home game or one, two at the casino, whatever. But once they want to take it to the level of being a break even or better player, now they have to enter the learning curve. And the barrier of entry to the learning curve is incredibly high, right? It's It's probably on the same level as the barrier of entry to like learning to become an engineer or a rocket scientist or a doctor, you know what I mean? Like just the entry level courses is really dense material. And the problem with the community right now is not only is it all very dense, but the material that isn't dense is bullshit, right? It's just the worst garbage that anybody can consume. So a lot of people are being steered in that direction and they're really just being rerouted until they come out the other side and then understand like, I haven't gotten any further and I just have a bunch of stuff I need to forget then they have a plethora of contradictory information that will allow them to finally enter the learning curve. And what ends up happening is once they get in, they're just constantly being distracted by something else that contradicts. And it's all higher level than they're capable of thinking. So now they're caught in the infinite loop where they're just continually regurgitating whatever's in vogue at the time, never actually getting out of the learning curve to the point of trend setting themselves. And that's, what we're trying to streamline, right? <laughs> we're trying to give them a direct path through the learning curve to the point where they're able to be independent thinkers. You just explain why most people don't win at poker and why the people who make it to high stakes and mid stakes online, you know, why these guys can do really well is because they they sort of get out of that and they yeah. get over that and they can conquer that and they can, I mean, yeah, it's- uh, Everybody uh, who's made it's innovative in one way or another, whether you're the best at PO or, you're the most abstract thinker and creative per person like Isildur, whatever. Like somebody, if you've made it, you have an unfair advantage in one of these realms as a linear thinker, an abstract thinker, or a combination of two. And everybody else is just trying to play catch up. Hmm. So when you say there's a lot of bullshit material out there, I guess, what are you, what are you being specific about? I mean, just like the general how-to books, right? Like the... <laughs> The, the one that's easiest to point to, and this isn't 
fair because it was a decade ago but like do you remember phil gordon's like uh like green book of little little, little low black green book, book green book yeah green book? Yeah, yeah whatever yeah yeah that that's just that concept has just been like retooled 25 ways to sunday since then uh it's just continually being pumped out by mass content creators and there are a lot of them they're just you know, i'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus but there's a lot of bullshit material out there of guys who are just pumping out heaps and heaps and heaps of volume throughout the course of the year and largely it's all trash it's all just micro learning instances that don't mean anything hmm. give me an example of that like a specific what? example that, okay. that 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 makes sense to me perfect one in a live venue why do people insist on raising 3x in in live cash i don't know because you have to right that's all they know nobody's True. ever examined no one's ever examined that question they just it was it was said to be true everybody else does it they just do it nobody challenges it nobody considers why why don't people limp that are serious about this game because you're not allowed Right? Like there are these certain boundaries that are just continually being reinforced by this low level bullshit. And uh, nobody's really willing to get outside those realms because it's making a ton of money. Like the barrier of entry into the learning curve is where the bulk of the money is in the community if you're trying to sell content. So let's let's go with the Olympic thing right there. So let's say you're going to teach a new player something or a new guys get into the game. Now, if you start teaching that person, well, I mean, you want to limp here and then you want to limp there. You want to do this and then you want to raise this. It seems to me that I guess from that situation, that just teaching a, a sort of basic game plan approach of just of raising three X. And this has sort of been proven to what, what works for a lot of people out there. It's, it makes sense. I can understand why people would just say, hey, do this, do that, sort of suggest that from a learning perspective. But you're saying that you think it's better if, I mean, I guess it, it makes sense if, if if that's the situation. It makes sense to, if you could teach that, hey, you should limp because of this, 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 and you want to raise because of this, this, that. But I think, I mean, it seems to me that that would be much harder to understand and grasp for people starting out with poker than it would be to say, hey, as a standard, you might want to take this route. Yeah, but think of like what, what we're implying with saying that. That means that we're saying this simple concept is too difficult for them to understand but we need right. to fast track them to get them onto more difficult concepts. Yeah. Right? Like if you can't comprehend why you should be choosing certain sizings pre or why or or how I guess you should be constructing a limp range versus a raise range, how on God's green earth are you ever going to dissect post flop play? But can you say at some point you you sort of take this, you take this 3x approach, right? And then you start playing, and now you you learn how to play a little bit post flop. Now you're making some money against the against the fun players who maybe don't even know a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can start. Okay, maybe I want to redefine my pre flop strategy. Whereas if you just start off trying to learn this and trying to learn that, you might never actually make it to that point where you're you're winning any money. And you might like just you don't go there. I guess you could you could argue this for both sides, right? Yeah. So. Hmm. I, I think I think that like uh, in a general sense in growing the game and keeping the ecosystem healthy as is is very important because of what you just said. It allows people to get to the point where uh, they're going to want to learn more and start back at the beginning. But the problem is, is that uh, the failure rate is then going to be astronomical right. because a lot of people who should have just failed out of the get go made it this far. And are now committed to something that they have no business being committed to. And there are a lot of people like that. And it's 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 probably the one sad aspect of poker. It's like the one area where I'm a little empathetic to people that we're taking money from because they kind of fell down a rabbit hole that is a wildly intriguing game that they have no chance in their lifetime of beating. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people out there watching this right now probably fall in the same category and they're in that same path and they're probably never going to win at poker consistently or I mean over any sample size really but I guess if someone out there is watching and thinking maybe this is me I mean what would you suggest to them that they if they want to fix it or I mean, just quit poker like what would you say that these guys no, out there should, should think about doing it's a pick up hoops game to them right like you can be the best guy in your in your local gym um, you know you just work on your shot a little bit and it's the same thing in this area it's like find good quality information that will allow you to reach your ceiling no matter how low or high it may be 
And I think that that's really what I was trying to arrive at is when we spoon feed these guys mechanics in the beginning with no why behind it, we ultimately create an incredibly low ceiling for them that's going to be near impossible to raise somewhere down the line because of the the pigeonholed thought that we've created where they're just forced down a path. So do you think you can take the idea that you have and is it something, I mean, is it something you even want to take to a bigger scale where it's something you can, I guess, you know, start helping thousands of people potentially, or is it something where you feel like it works really well and what you have it in right now, but you don't know if you can or even want to take it to that level, but you might want to go a little bit more mainstream with it, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of in that spot now. So we're sold out for the year. Like seven months ahead of time, we're sold out July, October, December. And we're considering adding more dates to accommodate. Um, but it's really time consuming. And it just, you know, it doesn't really scale to tens of thousands because when you lose the intimacy of it, when you lose the VIP aspect of it, which is really what we're offering, right? Like it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one when it's all said and done, whether it's through email exchange or whatever. Um, you dilute the product to a point where I wouldn't feel comfortable any longer, like mm. just offering this to 10,000 people. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not scalable in a more general sense. And that's really what I'm hoping to accomplish, right? Is that I think this is applicable to a lot of walks of life. And I want to generally be impactful and helpful when it's all said and done uh, on society in some facet. So whether this can be applied to general education or other niche uh, arenas, um, I would love to be the forefront of like trying to find a model in which this can now become applicable to uh, the long haul. We actually had a guy attend the last academy. Um, he is a part of a consulting firm and they consult for like Fortune 500 companies. And one of the things that we teach we do a segment on uh, like, you know, creating a business out of poker rather than just being an employee. And um, one of the examples is Jordan Young, one of my partners. Uh, I also have a, a partnership with him where um, we're 50-50 on a business together. And what that was, was I basically made him develop a business plan for how he would scale uh, a poker business from zero dollars to a million and just pitch me the way he would like Shark Tank. And it wasn't meant to be for me, right? Like I was trying to help him find backing and I find it to be like laughable the way the backing industry works now where it's literally just like call up somebody who has more money than you and say, hey, you think I'm a good poker player, right? You want to go 50-50 for free? Um, so I made him come up with like a very technical business uh, plan. And this is important because like we don't have transferable skills. I mean, we do, but we're, we're unaware of them. Right. And I don't have a business background. I, I taught myself all this stuff through, through the learning curve. And for him, it's like, okay, well you need to get backed. And if you don't get back, then you need to move on with your life. And in either regard, like this skill set will help you. So, you know, he did a lot of work. He did a lot of research. He came back to me. He has like, I was like, just treat it as a lemonade stand as to you're pitching me on wanting to invest in your lemonade stand and this is the growth potential and he gave me all the metrics all the expenses all the all the rules and regulations as far as like with x amount of the bankroll on the table i'll quit or i'll do this that or the other play this stake that stake this is where we move here's the path this is how i get to a million it's like wow this is good great i'm in here's a fifty thousand dollar seed to start we'll go 50 50 but the rules are that uh, you have to reinvest in the business. So anytime you take a distribution of profits, we both do. Otherwise it stays and that's how you'll move up the stakes. So like, you know, he takes a salary every month and then I take one accordingly and then the rest of it just stays. And he's grown the company to 200K now. And it's like, he went from playing 2.5 to 2550. And like, you know, that's the path. And we're gonna, we're gonna continue down it. So we presented it. And this guy from the consulting firm was just like, man, I can't believe you guys came up with this without much background. He's like, this is something we would present a Fortune 500 company. And he recently emailed me and was like, you know, put some thought into it, but I'd love to have you come speak at like a business conference. And like, that's the trajectory that like I would love to go down. It's an awesome story, man. Shout out to uh, 
you said Jordan Young, right? His name is yeah. uh, Master. Yeah, man. I, I, you know, I've heard, I've heard that name before. I don't, I don't think I've, I don't think I met him before. I, maybe I have, but I've heard his name from a ton of different people over time, over the years, and I've heard some, I've heard good things about him too. So I guess it makes sense why you guys are friends. I feel like I've heard a lot of good things about you know most of the people that I know that you. We're both laggy spews, man. so you know we 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 gravitate to one another. You know, I've heard that too, and I, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I think people will say something about me sometimes too. So it's uh. I don't know, man. It's more fun. It's more fun to put some money in the pot than it is to fucking fold and be a nit, man. I'm not. I'm not here to tell anybody <laughs> they should fold. I'm here to put money in, man. I, that's why yeah, I put PLO. I, man, that's a whole other aspect that like just drives me insane, especially because like so many more of the younger generations have come up online, and you have to seek those micro edges. But like in the live venue, it's like it's meant to be a fun, gambly atmosphere, and mm -hmm. we don't get to play a hundred thousand hands a year. We only get to play like you know a couple thousand maybe. 10,000 tops, whatever. So the only way for us to control volume is the amount of hands that we choose to play profitably, not like the the duration of time we can sit at the table and be dealt in. I'm just not going to get afforded enough spots against this random drunk spot who decided to sit in this big game this one time. I have to play mm -hmm. all the fucking hands. And so I better be equipped to do so. I don't want to just be like, oh no, there's this guy who's a massive spot and I'm not good enough to expand my range here. So just going to stick to the charts, hope for the best. Maybe I'll get them, maybe I won't. Like, that's not me. That's not the way I play. And quite frankly, like, once you go down that path, like, I don't need the drunk spot. I'll create the drunk spot. It's war out there. People, people fall into the psychological aspect of it. People want to battle if you challenge them to. And if they don't, that, that doesn't mean they just shut down and stop putting money in the pot. They just start putting it in passively. What more could you ask for? So I, I <laughs> that's a very interesting subject on its own. I want to go back to something you said about, you said Jordan built, so the company you're talking about that he built, is this, this is the solve for why? No, no, no. Or this is just like, different. yeah, this is our version of staking. Oh, um, okay. It's a, it's a totally separate thing then. I wasn't yeah, sure. Yeah. I just, yeah, I just wanted to be clear that it wasn't like me giving him 50K and us just going 50-50 where he took home the profits and I was left on the hook to keep reinvesting. Okay. Like it's literally, he's building a company. Uh, you know, in, in a traditional sense, like when you start a business from scratch, you have to put the money, the profits back into the company. You know, you don't just get to take it all out. And that was what I challenged him to do. It's like, show me how we're going to get to a million together and, uh, you know, show me the path of, of how you're going to get to rise to the ranks accordingly. Like basically I said, you know, if you have aspirations to play high stakes, then you have to be the one funding it. And you'll be protected through the insurance policy of knowing that I'm funding the other half. But it's not as simple as you make 100K and keep 50 and then just still have this 50K stake available. Like, that's not okay. Very interesting stuff here, man. This is one of my, uh, this is quite, this is this, I, tomorrow's going to be uh, a slightly different podcast. So this is going to be quite the interesting <laughs> transition to go from discussing this kind of stuff with you and then talking to Phil. And it's going to be fun, man. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to expect tomorrow, man. Tomorrow's going to be. Uh, uh, I'll be watching. <laughs> it's gonna be an interesting day, man, for sure. I appreciate all the comments, all the questions out there, guys, on Twitch, on YouTube. Uh, much loved, everybody out there, and um, kind of just throw us again in the middle if you're tuning in. You know, kind of. Uh, we initially start off with the with the show, the Dead Money Show, Super High Roller Bowl show that or Super, Dead Money Path to Super High Roller Bowl that you have uh, that it's now out on Poker Central's new thing, Poker. It's gonna take me a while to even uh, say that in a GTO way, but. You know, talk about the show a little bit more, man. So what's what exactly can people expect to see during this show? Um, we really just wanted to like peel back the curtain and kind of show, you know, a little bit of what the the process looks like when you're playing the biggest shit in the world. Um, like pretty much the way I, uh, I came up with the idea was I couldn't sleep two summers ago. I, I just like had a sleepless night and I, I, I couldn't take it. So I got out of bed, like my mind was just racing and... I was suddenly hit with this idea of like, if you were fortunate enough to final table the main event, what would you do to capitalize on the on the time off between then and the November nine? And it's it's a sore point where I thought like almost nobody did anything to help themselves, right? Like everybody just looked for sponsorship handouts when they weren't there. They were just like, okay, I guess I'll just like try to watch some tape and uh, be ready for this sit and go. And it's crazy to me. It's like, yeah, you've made a million dollars, but holy fuck, you're playing for eight million. Like, I would slave for three months. You would not see me like 
going to WSOPE and trying to bink something else in between. It would just be like, I would be doing two things. I'd be in the lab for, for the actual event itself. And then I would just be doing everything under the sun to capitalize on the momentum that my name and this opportunity had. So I started to like scale it out on my chalkboard. I'm just like writing down all these ideas of how I would prep uh, the team that I would assemble, the coaches that I felt like I was, the areas I felt like I was weakest in that I needed some some aid, put all that together. Then I, I put together like uh, the, the promotional side. It was just like, I would start blogging. I would start having a film crew follow me around. I would do all this stuff. And it just, kind of presented itself as an opportunity when the super high roller bowl came to be and my backing crew was was behind me they're like yeah let's do it it's like this is this is a black swan event this is a once in a lifetime opportunity i'm going to do everything in my power to take take control of it so uh around that time i started to blog my backstory and it was getting like tremendous feedback uh and it was shortly after both my mother and grandmother had passed and i'd written two blogs about them as well um the one well they both ended up uh they both were helpful in allowing me to create a relationship where i became a huffington post contributor as well um and i was just like yeah there's something here like this is interesting to people they want to hear about how i grew up about you know the drug use my mom went through and all this other stuff so i was just like okay i'm gonna start blogging it and when i got into it i was like this is gonna be a good story to tell if I can show the preparation for how you get ready for a 300K event and intertwine it with my backstory, like I know that if I weren't playing this event, this is something I would want to watch, right? And mm -hmm. that's all I was really caring about. It's just like, can we do something really good? Because this isn't like some sort of pet narcissistic project where I just want people to pat me on the back and say, hey, good job. I, I like who you are as a person. This was literally... I think there's a massive gap in content where nothing good really exists and we can do something that's genuinely good, whether I'm the center of it or we get somebody else and plug them in. I don't care, but this is definitely the metric and the path to doing so. So how do you feel like, I guess you mentioned preparing for this. How do you feel like this differs from playing high stakes cash or preparing for another tournament that might be hundred K or, you know, like, so, what do you think is, I guess, separates this from, from those things? Um, knowledge of the field is what separates it from like 100K, I think. Hmm. So you know the players going into it. That's huge. Um, the separation between this and cash are just, you know, they're two completely different disciplines. It's like you can really separate yourself from the field in cash, I think, due to the deep stack nature and the skill sets that could be derived throughout the course of really studying it i'm sure you could do the same in tournaments but just the variance in and of itself when playing against a tough field keeps people a lot closer together and i think that really speaks to like how impressive fedor has been over the last 18 months or so because it's very very clear to me at least that he has some sort of understanding of a deviation in general strategy that is allowing him to do what he's doing sure some of its positive variants but this isn't coincidental uh, again like when the solves begin to present themselves we're going to get to see what fedor was doing and how impossible it is to like recreate do you think that's going to come one day where this is going to come out where sort of these other strategies that you know like you mentioned is their strategy or, or tom duan or phil ivy or I mean, I guess Zygmunt at PLO, <laughs> you know, Zygmunt at PLO where he plays a quite a unique style and he's always played a quite a unique style. So you think at some point in time, something's going to come out that will be able to, to show that this was its own form of, of a GTO strategy or a GTO approach to, to the game? I mean, I think that's just as likely of happening as there being one specific, this is how you beat Texas Hold'em, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the, the outcry from the community uh, is that, this game at some point in time will be completely solved and we're going to have to deal with that. And that's very likely to be true, I think. But I also think that it's going to look very different than what we perceive the solve to be right now. And moreover, the ap actual applications of it will almost be non-existent. Like it may eliminate online poker right. because AI is available there. But you, as of now, AI isn't available in the live realm. 
and literally just banning it would keep people at bay, right? Like it's a social game first and foremost. And as long as that doesn't change, the game will still exist and thrive, which is very, very important to me to keep that in the forefront of everybody's mind because I don't want to see the smart people ruin this game. You know what I mean? Like the people who are so nihilist that they just want to, they, they just want the proof that they can solve something so complex that the idea of destroying it doesn't matter. Mm. So you think that's what, what's going on right now then with all the, the bot, all the people with the programs and the bots taking on Nolan Hold'em and Texas Hold'em and trying to, I guess, solve it or, or you know, beat the format? Uh, yeah, I'm glad they're doing it. I think it's really good. I think it'll, I think it'll expand out into other realms and uh, allow us to further technology in a lot of arenas. Um, and I think even with the bots, you can see a little bit of like what I'm saying. There was a lot of things that that right. bot did that mm -hmm. are just considered un unexamined thus far. Right? We just chalk it up as bad, and we don't even we don't even bother to examine it. And this is how I developed my tournament strategy eight years ago, seven years ago, is what are the worst players doing? And me as someone who I consider to be good, what can I do to, to emulate them instead of emulating the other good reg, right? So I developed a limping strategy, like bad players limp and no one else limps. So why don't I figure out how to limp? My, 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 I felt like my uh, edge was post-flop and if you get into a pre-flop battle, you're just shallow. Like there's, there's no way to go post. So if I limp, now all of a sudden, I can go post a lot more. And at the time I was doing it, like 2009, 2010, I was a complete unknown. So I just got categorized as a fish. I smashed the 100 rebuy on stars for the better part of six months. Like just limping aces and watching it get four bet back to me. It's like, guess I'm all in. This, this is an easy way to make a living for the short period of time. And obviously, like the adjustments came, but so did Black Friday. So I didn't have to worry about it. Right. Uh, Joel in the chat says, first he says he wants to destroy, he wants, first he says he doesn't want people to destroy the game by trying to solve it. And then he says he loves bots. No, I don't love, well, all right, that's completely out of context. Uh, I don't want the game to be destroyed through the applications. Uh, I don't care if the game arrives at a solve. I think that there's a lot of good that comes from that. And that's what I was trying to say is like, when we arrive at the solve, I think, what will actually happen is eyes will be open to how vast this game is and how how impossible it is for us to just naturally go down the pathway of the solve. Therefore, we're going to have to live in the deviations. And that's going to create a myriad of strategies and styles similar mm -hmm. to what we already have. Um, what I don't want to see happen is the game get destroyed through the applications, where now suddenly AI is just available to everybody sitting in a game Right. And we no longer have the social element or the human element, right? Like once it's just nine computers playing against each other at a table, the game's dead. That's what I don't want to have happen. Well, hopefully that, I mean, ho you hope that wouldn't happen. I don't know if some Black Mirror type shit's going to come across where you got the computer chip in your mind and you're able yeah. to, to process this. You know, I mean, if the singularity comes to be, then poker is going to be the least of our yeah. concerns. <laughs> uh, so I guess like if that happens, the game dies small sacrifice you don't play uh you don't play pop in omaha right i actually played heads up plo specifically online for the better part of like five years um it's how i learned to play well post interesting like so why do you think why do you think playing plo helped you learn i mean you, i guess we could say you might have learned how to play well post playing nolan at home too but how do you think that that helped you out specifically definitely omaha is what did it uh and it's because in Omaha, at least the common thought process back then was as the board texture changes, so does the strength of your hand, right? So the nuts are no longer the nuts street by street. And just being very aggressive, I understood that. And it allowed me to kind of comprehend blockers and things like that before that was just common knowledge type thing. Um, and I just saw like a ton of success in massive amounts of aggression in that game. And that's why I stuck to the heads up format because when you start doing it six handed or nine handed, your your hand selection absolutely matters. Mm -hmm. And I did not, I still don't have any comprehension of hand selection. Like I, I just couldn't even begin to chart out a PLO uh, 
hand selection range. So um, it was one of those things where it just like greatly intrigued me post. And whenever I was able to scale it back and carry it over to No Limit Hold'em, I just realized like I'm so infatuated with this game because it's so much more subtle the way the board textures change and, and are categorized. And it just allowed me to really begin to figure out where all the leverage points lie. And I didn't think anybody else was really doing that. So you were probably not folding the button or or the blind. Never. I would imagine you probably weren't folding ever at heads up PLO back at back then, right? No, and my three by frequency was just stupid. Uh, I don't know if you remember Andrew Wiggins. Yeah, I, I know, I know Andrew. Oh, yeah, man. we used to battle uh, on full tilt, and like he literally wrote a blog about the value of getting it in bad and sucking out in a heads up. Uh, cash match just to to send your your opponent into orbit and it's like i mean we i believe, we I believe that's a thing by the way i i completely believe that is an actual thing yeah. against certain players so i'm 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 a fan of the of the tilt equity you potentially get when you when you beat an opponent or you make a fucking crazy play and, and you stack them or you get it in bad sure. and you win yeah but like now you would do it with hands that are close back then it was just like oh this hand's the same color that's that's fun <laughs> let's just do it so um, I think, yeah, I think the whole entire never fold the blinds. I mean, this really wasn't really widely discussed until maybe three, four years ago, something like that. But I think there were other other guys before that that have been doing it for a long time and just been fucking crushing using that strategy. They just never fold the blind, never fold the blind, and never fold the button and heads up, and they just in the pot, in the hand every hand. And uh, yeah, it, it was kind of. I think I mean I, I think one person that brought that over to Six Max that played a lot of heads up was like Cole South. He's like ridiculously aggressive at, and I'm pretty sure he still is now, although I think he has also gone into entrepreneur life, shout out to CTS. And a lot of people saw that and they're like, man, what the fuck's like, what are these people doing? And now, then finally you're like, oh wait, you don't actually ever have to fold a PLO because you just, you don't have to. And then yeah. I guess, you don't, as you know, we talked about you don't have to, or yeah, I guess you don't have to is the proper way to say it. But, and then, yeah, you can play it profitably. You can just never fold and you can do very well. Yeah. And then the deviations from that occur, right? Like then people start overplaying spots. Uh, we see it a lot in MTTs now. Uh, I wasn't folding big blinds the second min raising became a thing. It's just like I'll never fold. I'm getting way too good of a price. I'll play any two from the blinds. And for four or five years, I was the only one defending wide that I knew in my close group anyway from blinds. And it's like, oh, you're so bad. How are you calling with 10-4 suited here? It's just like I'm not going to explain myself. I'm just doing it, and I promise you I'm profiting. Um, and then it became understood like – you should start defending the blinds a lot wider. And now I think it's getting to a point where it's gone the whole other way. People are over defending the big blind. And uh, there's a lot to be made from from that aspect of the, the world too. So when you think about how are you defending 10-4 offsuit and you say, I just am, I mean, is there a way that you can prove it to yourself that you are winning in that spot or is it off complete sort of just being aware of what's happening and memory or like, how do you, how can you figure out for sure that that is a spot where you are making money? Well, now I think I could, uh, there's enough help out there to, to figure it out. 2010 when I was doing it, it was just, I had a lot of faith in my line work where I was doing, you know, I had examined all the possible lines and I had made them readily available to myself. So I had ranges that other people didn't, I would lead, I would check, raise, check. I, I would take these lines that no one else was really taking and I had put in, put in enough work with them where I thought that they were quantifiably effective. I couldn't necessarily attach uh, a big blind per hundred to it, but right. um, I was pretty confident given the results and, and everything else that they were working. I mean, that's kind of the argument a lot of other people have out there is they say, well, you know, you're doing this play like this seems fucking terrible. And you're like, I mean, well, I think for me, I can make it profitable. I can make it work. I make it good. And it might not even be the specific hand, but just me learning how to play this spot better just pays off for me in the future from these future spots. And you got to get that. And this this becomes my unique edge. This becomes where I have an efficient strategy that you perceive as inefficient. And I know how to play this much better than other people are going to be able to play it because I've been doing it for so long. And I guess when it comes down to, well, then how can you prove that? And that's, I think, where why when someone tries to prove it, you know, they sometimes sound, you know, they don't, they're not, they don't, they don't really prove it to a lot of people. Whereas some other guys might say, oh, well, no, I can prove it here. Like, let me show you this. This is this solver, that and that. And I think that's why people always perceive their strategies like, well, they just have to be terrible because yeah, 
you know, it's, the it's, the, it. it's, it's the linear versus abstract mindset again. And that's, that's kind of, I, I tweeted a few days ago because I was having a discussion about this. I think you actually got thrown into it where uh, I was talking to, uh, Steve. yeah, Steve McLaughlin about it. And uh, I ended up just like tweeting when I was just fed up with, with, I mean, him and I are on the same page, but like, you know, it's just the random subtweet from somebody else where they're challenging and it's just annoying. And I just tweeted, uh, at some point you have to ask yourself, what are you looking for? Proof or results? And I, I think that's really what it boils down to is the linear path of proving something and then arriving at that proof and now being able to apply it or just having the courage to trailblaze, get to a result and then try to reverse engineer it. The latter is going to keep you ahead of the curve. The former is going to keep you behind the eight ball where you have to arrive at the proof first. Otherwise, you're now behind the trend, right? And anytime you're behind the trend, your application is going to have to be more perfect than the field. That's a difficult way to live. Like, that's just not the way I've ever constructed strategy. I understand I'm very fallible and that I want to embrace my imperfections by figuring out how I can do things differently rather than more perfectly. So uh, an interesting tweet you made a long time ago, I guess maybe a couple months back that I really enjoyed, but I never wanted to talk about it on the podcast because it's just really good strat. And now we'll just talk about it. So you said, to all the game selectors, seat hoppers, and general micro edge seekers, you're doing it wrong. Get better at poker, find other employment. Now I went, I, I've worked, I've gone on my way not to talk about this ever and not okay. talk about why if you script it's bad, why, like what doing these type of habits and what, you know, sort of having this approach to poker is going to do to you long term. And because I mean, I don't, I, you know, the fuck, fuck the scripters. I don't necessarily want to enlighten them on why this might be poor, poor long term. But I guess go into that a little bit more. What's, uh, can I break that down? So to all the game selectors, seat hoppers and general micro edge seekers, you're doing it, you're doing it wrong. Get better at poker, fight or employment. All right. So first, I'm going to help you to want to talk about this because I think that that's really important. Um, I understand the reason to not because fuck those guys. They'll eventually just, uh, you know, evolution will just take the best of them and they'll die off. The problem is the game will slowly die with them. Um, we need those guys to stop doing what they're doing and be a, bot uh, a part of the bottom of the ecosystem for other people who are stronger than them to feed off of. And without that, with them retaining that micro edge as long as they possibly can, mm -hmm. it's gonna create bad environments where now the fun players don't wanna play, the break even players don't wanna play, and it's literally just the best regs battling it out against the best micro edge seekers. Um, and that just makes for like really poor poker. And I don't know enough to speak to the online realm because it's an apocalyptic wasteland as far as I'm concerned. Like, I just assume that it's a battle of who has the best software at this point and who's able to apply it in the, in the most accurate fashion. But in the live realm, it's always so apparent when you have a micro edge seeker at your game and he's absolutely hated. There's nothing worse than a short stacker who hits and runs. There's nothing worse than the guy who always gets position on the fish, like just fights tooth and nail, is getting the floor called over because he has the first seat change button, whatever. Like this just ruins dynamics. Moreover, it exposes these exploits to people who are otherwise ignorant to them. And that's a massive social problem, right? Nobody wants to be aware of the fact that they're being taken advantage of or that they're not taking advantage of a, a, an obvious situation. People will still happily go to a car dealership, having the wool pulled over their eyes, coming home telling you how good of a deal they got because they didn't pay sticker price, right? It's an insane process, but we all choose to be naive to it and continue through our lives in order to get out of bed every morning thinking we made the best decision possible. It's very important to create that same environment in poker. And my tweet was very misunderstood in the sense that people thought I was saying, pass up on all the, the soft games that you see and just go throw yourself into the toughest game possible. Right. Though I do think that will give you a good callus for what you're capable of achieving in this game, that wasn't at all what I was saying. What I was saying is, if your reliance is on these micro edges in order to make a living, I feel for you understand that you have one foot out the door and that you really need to start seeking other employment because one day that micro edge is no longer going to exist and you're not going to know what to do. And I don't want you to arrive to that point, right? I want you to be stable and have a good living already lined up for when you can't seat change any longer or when you can't 
just bum hunt games. And in the uh, again, in the live realm, this is just like the worst thing imaginable. It was a carryover from uh, a Facebook group I was speaking with, with some of the lo local grinders who are game starters. And they just provide like a massive value. Like they make all games good. They're good players, they're winning players, but they create fun, fun environments. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the don't give a fuck thread on two plus two. Yeah. Uh, I started playing with him in 2008. He was the first person that I recognized was great for poker, but moreover that I was going to have to go through if I wanted to get better at this game. So I stopped analyzing how to beat the weaker players in the game. And I strictly started focusing on how to neutralize him. Everything else took care of itself. And in figuring out how to neutralize him, I also figured out how to be an asset to games myself. I don't sit in bad games because they don't exist as long as I'm there. There's half the community that will tell you I'm the worst player they've ever come across and they're thrilled to play with me. And then the other half is terrified to ever be in a game with me. <laughs> what better, what better uh, portrayal can you have in a sense that like you'll just always have action? And I feel like this is a path where, where Doug kind of got fucked because he became elite at a game where the competition could just choose to not play you. And that sucks. Mm -hmm. Like if you're good at six max or nine max or, or live poker, you'll never empty a table. I should say never. I've emptied a table a time or two. But it's it's not common where eight people are just going to say, that's it, racks. You know what I mean? They're just forced to play with you. Same thing with so many of these MTT pros. Like uh, I bashed them for a long time because I hate tournaments. They're so stupid. But they're so profitable. And... You can't ever get shut out. I have to fight tooth and nail to like get an invite into a big game. These guys can go play 100K every week if they want to. Like They just don't get shut out. The, the competition has to confront them. Um, this is a really good way to go about growing your business, and it's something that's just lost on these micro-edge seekers. That's fine. So I can confirm I've heard both sides of what you said about yourself. I've heard that. I like, I said, like I said before, I think... Um, I I Being 50 50, <laughs> me saying 50 50 was very, very generous to myself. It's probably much more 80 20. I don't know. No, it's not, not anymore. Maybe like a year or two ago, it may have been more skewed there. I don't think, I, I don't think anymore though. Cause I remember during the Super Horrible when you played, a lot of people said, you know, who's like, who's my at Berkey? And just from like knowing the high stakes scene, I knew a little bit about you and I knew what other people said. But I think now it's, it's, it's getting more. We're like, no, man, that guy's just fucking insane and he's crazy and he might do some crazy shit, but. Not necessarily. I mean, I don't know. Some people enjoy that. They they like playing with that. They like action. They want to have fun. They want to go there and they want to battle. But everybody can enjoy that. Like, if I represent the drunk guy, everybody wants the drunk guy in their game. Nobody wants to lose to the drunk guy, of course. So that becomes an issue. But everybody should want a callus to a game where, or a catalyst to a game where where you know all the action is just going to revolve around one person. And it's what kept me in the high stakes for so long. Like, I don't necessarily. You know, I, I don't necessarily have a means to getting invited to this game outside of the fact that I've earned it, that I'm a facilitator, that millions and millions of dollars goes through my hands when I'm in the game. Hmm. I guess sort of like going back to the, the tweet that you said, because you, you said a couple of different things. And you said that some people took it the wrong way. They said it was only this way or that way. And I think a lot of people that I talk to do take it that way too, where it's like, you know, you can still take some micro red. you can still bomb hunt a little bit you can still game select a little bit you can still you can still take those micro reds but at the same time you're still consistently working to get better at your game and still putting yourself in positions to potentially play better players to even put yourself in a position where you may not have any edge in that spot in the short term and in the long term it's something you can gain an edge in and you only get that by by fucking battling and by just putting yourself in that spot but also balancing it with other times where you maybe can make some easier money to get you through the variance that you're going to incur taking this strategy. And yeah. um, I mean, online, you mentioned online being a wasteland. I think online is, I mean, I, I don't know what people really know about what the online ecosystem is at high stakes for cash games right now, but it's very, it's very, very strange in that, you know, the seed scripts are very much what run the streets on poker stars. But there's a lot of other sites now. There's a lot of these underground games. These under like there's multiple countries have their own little underground ecosystem, and no scripts are on there. Shout out to the scripts. Right. Thank God you haven't made it there yet. And I, and some of the other sites, some of the other untracked, uh, I guess the regular tracked American sites and the regularly tracked European sites, and 
you know, the other countries that exist out there with the sites that people know about. They're really uh, scripting, you know, it isn't as it is on stars right now, but it seems like on stars, it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's completely changed. You got all these motherfucking, uh, you know, Dan Fu. I don't want to mention Dan, shout out to Dan Fu, who's my buddy, but still him, him scripting the other guys. They, they're just always there scripting in these high stakes games. And, and yeah, man, I think it really does ruin, ruin the experience for regulars, for regulars of all types and for recreational players of all types as well, too. Yeah, I, I don't think like, you know, somewhere along the line, we began to glorify the data miners and the the guys who can crunch numbers. And that's so stupid. Like there's actual skill involved in this game. And being the guy who just constantly always gets the Jesus seat is not a skill, right? It's an unfair advantage that is somehow created through software, but you're not better than the guy who's legitimately more skillful than you at this game. And that sucks. Um, and from the live point of view, what I was really talking about is if your regular game is 10, 20 and you're in a must move and it gets down to five handed against four other regs, don't rack up and keep your name on the list and let that game break. Like you're a terrible human being. <laughs> bang, bang. It's like stop playing this stake if you can't handle that scenario. And like, I mean, when I was grinding those stakes, that was... That was literally the Bellagio every day. The must move gets down to five-handed. One or two guys sit sit out because they don't like playing short or moreover, they're just afraid of the lineup, whatever the case may be. And the other two just don't want to battle. And that sucks because it's like when you're the one willing to battle and now you're fifth on this list because the other four don't want to play with you. Uh, it, it's very unfair. And, you know, casinos can do a little bit to adjust this should they choose to do so. Same with stars. They can do a lot to adjust this should they choose to do so. It's not being addressed. So I'm asking the community as a whole, like, address it, police it yourself, like, call these people out, do what you need to do, like, force them down a stake if need be. Bury them when they're in your game. Like, I, I think that there's a lot of room for the interpersonal wars in this game. Attack somebody. You know, if he's too cowardly to play you five-handed, he's too cowardly to four-bet you light, too. Every time you got position on him, use it. And this is just like kind of the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that that I kind of have whenever I'm playing. Mm. You mentioned also about how it's easy for all these guys to play tournaments. And by the way, guys, there's been a lot of bang-bangs today. I've only, I only, I had to get like at least one bang-bang in there, but there have been a lot, you know, I, I'm just, and uh, someone in the chat, uh, let me read this comment. He said that what happened to Joey who is this guy talking? Who is the guy that's never reading chat today and discussing strategy? And uh, that's sure you're right. You know, I'm getting into strategy here, but I'm, uh, I'm very much, I'm very much enjoy. I'm enjoying the perspective that you come from because it's much different than, um, as you said, it's much different than majority of the community, and it's something that I, I mean, I don't know. I guess uh, I tend to think I pro approach poker and PLO the same, very similar type of way, and that's sort of how I've gone about it and how I've thought about it and how I've you know, just gotten good at it over time and which it, makes sense why you don't want to talk strategy because uh, it, it does feel like it's so exploitative that if you start to leak the way you think people will adjust exactly and that's why when Sever says why don't you stream plo that's exactly why i don't stream plo because i do feel like it is super exploitative where if you knew how i was approaching spot and how i'm approaching this player type this way this player type that way this that way well, then not only one, you learn a very unique approach to it. And two, you learn pretty much how, how I'm going to think about it and how I'm playing it. And, you know, whether I feel like if you have that information, it's just it, it, it's going to be it's going to be smart to have that when you're playing against me. So sure. that's the biggest reason why I've never streamed is because it's not as sort of theoretically, I guess, balanced and as as most people are. And um, and yeah, I mean, that's been the biggest reason why I've really never wanted to stream me playing. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. It's it's the same when I stream. Uh, we, we got into Twitch a little bit a couple weeks ago or about a month ago, whatever. When I do stream, it's literally like I don't talk about a single hand. I'm playing 10 cent, 25 cent, some shit like that. And it's really more about, you know, a lot of what we were talking about earlier. It's about driving good content. We're having good conversations. We're basically having a fireside chat with people being able to watch some poker in the background. And, you know, maybe we suck out for a hundred dollar pot and uh, get some applause in the chat. But, yeah, I'm not going to stream a 1020 no limit game where I have to play top notch A plus. Like I'm shoving dark in the game that I'm streaming, and that's fun too. 
So do you think if you did stream it where where you were playing and, and talking, do you think that would like what do you think that would just give away too much about your game or do you think it would help other players out potentially that might be playing in your game or they would just know potentially how you're playing these spots and what you're sort of what you're thinking about and then they'll know how to play against you better and, and sort of exploit you in that spot it's tough to say because if i were streaming online it's all 100 big blind play and i'll be the first to admit that i'm pretty weak there so um it would probably if nothing else just expose the areas that uh i lack fundamentals and i think that would suck that would be a little problematic but it wouldn't necessarily carry over into the deeper games that i play in um from a from a strategy standpoint yeah like i this is the most uh the most i've exposed probably on a podcast as far as like the way i think i'm sorry um, i'm asking these questions then because i <laughs> no no no, no, no. <laughs> i I, w I wouldn't answer them if i weren't comfortable doing so i still think that like you know most people think i suck and that's fine because it'll keep them from listening to what I'm saying. Um, you know, I just anticipate, I've lived with Dan O'Brien for eight years and largely he still thinks I absolutely suck. And we've had way more in-depth conversations than I'm having with you right now. So as long as I have that whole world of the poker community, like painted with that broad brush, then I'm not really concerned about like leaking too much information. Uh, shout out to Dan O'Brien, the low-key savage himself, always on the low, <laughs> getting savage and getting motherfucking out of line. Uh, Gonna stack, you said, is it not inevitable that some percentage of poker players will need to find new jobs as the game becomes stale and edges become thinner? A lot of people on Joey's streams will have new jobs in 10 years, right? Yeah, I don't, and I don't think it's because of the game getting tougher, edges getting thinner. I think it's just the nature of the beast, right? Like, It's just like any other arena, highly competitive arena. Uh, every year, thousands of people enter the minor league system in Major League Baseball. And every year, 90% of them are looking for new work, right? The turnover rate is just really high. Yeah, I think also, I mean, you play poker for so long, at some point in time, if you have success at it and you reach a point of success, you sort of want to sometimes move on. You want to find a new challenge. You want to see what else is out there in the world. And I think once you start learning about what else the world has to offer you, you sort of realize like, oh, okay, I've been playing poker 10 years. Maybe I'll go like explore some reading. I'll go explore traveling. I'll go explore all these other things that I didn't spend the past five, six, seven years exploring. And, and then you just become interested in other things. And with online landscape just being so much more challenging, the, the ecosystem's a little bit out of line, maybe some shady activity, much more shady activity happening now, debatably then i mean you're just like well why am i going to keep doing this when i can maybe do this i can take my money or i could take my knowledge and i can go try to start something else or try to do something else yeah i mean like you know largely um it's a really really intelligent high moral fiber community right like obviously there are outliers to that there are a lot of not a lot but there are scumbags and there are idiots in this game but mostly it's wildly intelligent people and somewhat cultured people. So it's not really shocking that poker eventually becomes more of a platform than a lifelong pursuit. And I think once you do reach a certain level of success, it now becomes something that you can literally move off of uh, or laterally move off of rather and you know, cultivate other opportunities. Uh, I, I've said this a million times, the, the biggest asset that I ever received from poker is the fact that I have three or four guys in my phone that I could text at any point in time who have hundreds of millions of dollars and would be all in on any idea because they've invested in me as a human being. Um, and that's just like, that's worth more than any amount of money that I've ever made because there's a lot to life that's just bigger than poker and hopefully uh those of us who are interested in using our intellect elsewhere will be able to make an impact hmm. do you do you do you see said you wrote a blog but outside of that do you do you write a lot um i have throughout my adulthood uh but almost all of it's just come in that blog form hmm. um i've been getting pushed for probably the last five years to write a book but i just can't imagine i'm ever going to do it like the idea like if I were to write a book, it would have been something like Dead Money. And it just is so much easier to do it in video form where you can just talk. I'm so oh. critical of the way I write. Like I go over one sentence six or seven times until it like reads perfectly. Mm. 
because I, I say that because I, I had a prop bet writer write a book, 40,000 word book. And I was, I never, I never really wrote anything and I never was thought I would thought I'd ever write anything or I've never like written a long more than a couple thousand words at one time, if ever. Mm. So, so I wrote, when I wrote the book, I was really this like sort of deep exploration into my mind and it's sort of all these things came out and I realized all these things about myself and about sort of these qualities that I may have had or may have struggled with that I gotten better at that I never really figured out until I started really sitting down and writing and sort of digging deep into my mind. And and I don't know, it's it's just this, I, I never thought like that it would that would have happened when I when I sat down to write the book. But I feel like with yourself, I mean, I, don't know, I feel like with yourself, that could be something where you sort of get to this point where you can tap into that like subconscious flow state when you're just writing and you block out everything around you and these thoughts and ideas might come out that kind of just explore a lot of these things even in even more in depth and potentially even learn more about yourself. Yeah. So my assert or my assumption, I guess, uh, not knowing you personally. But I assume that you filter a lot of what you go through on the pod, like, you know, just from a strategy standpoint or even in a lot of ways, maybe like the depths of your thoughts, because uh, there's there's potential exploits in them and you don't necessarily want to reveal them to a mass crowd. Um, and I'm not sure what your inner circle looks like, but if you're not really if you're not ever really put into a position to give somebody else guidance then all these thoughts just kind of like get suppressed inside of you. And for better or for worse, uh, I just have a few people in my life that have kind of always been that one step behind where they're coming to me for advice. And I've just got to have a lot of exhaustive talks. And honestly, it's really not because of them being who they are. It's because of the situations I've put myself through going broke so many times and actually having to figure it all out. Um, so yeah, between writing and just talking a lot, like, I think that's how I got to such a high level of transparency and how a lot of these introspective thoughts have become way more in the forefront of my mind rather than deep inside my subconscious. Mm. Um, and one of the big things that, that did it was in 2013, after I had finally re accumulated some money. <laughs> um, I made a vision board and, uh, I, I've always just been like, so, uh, I guess inspired by the David Foster Wallace, this is water talk. Um, it was a commencement speech he delivered to Kenyon college, uh, before he killed himself. And, you know, the premise behind the talk is basically that we all like to think in this world revolves around me type mentality. But if you can remove yourself from that, like you see just how, objectively the world functions and, and and where we fit into it all um and i remember writing on my vision board that i wanted to deliver a commencement speech at some point in my life and a couple months after the world series uh, where i made three final tables uh my alma mater reached out to me and asked me if i would do exactly that and just talk about coming from a small town and how to achieve success in a competitive niche field and it was just like oh, yeah sure i'm in not even like giving it a second thought until I realized like they're asking me to speak for 90 minutes and I've literally never spoken public in my life up until this point, like zero public speeches outside of like, you know, addressing the baseball team in college as a captain or whatever. And, uh, I got to work. It was just like, I dove in head first where uh, I picked right up where I left off of the self-actualizing process and then just started to study people who are the best at what they do, the Gary V's, the Simon Sinek's, the, you know, these public speakers and motivators who are just the best ET, Eric Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, he's super shallow in his messages, but they're so powerful and good. It's just like, I consumed this for hundreds of hours until finally it was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I just have to like take off the training wheels, any sort of filters or barriers that I might have and just like lay it all out there. And when I finally got to, to framing it, uh, I thought I was going to end up like writing a lot of it out. It was just like bold face bullet points. And I had one note card and just went up there and smashed it for 90 minutes. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. You just went up there. You, did you practice the speech or it was just like this was the first time you did it and you just sort of went with it? Two days before I delivered it to like my close group of friends. There's probably 15 or 20 of us. And I couldn't start. I was so shook. They're my, they're my closest friends, right? They're guys that have been out here with me for the last decade. 
And I just could not start. I was standing up there holding my note card, just staring at him. I couldn't find the word to start. And then once like I was able to get that first sentence out, it just flowed. And I never, never fumbled over my words, never took a pause, just video recorded the whole thing, went back through, watched it. I was just like, all right, I'm, I'm ready. I know this stuff. And that was where I kind of like really began to understand that like a lot of where our fear stems from is the gaps in knowledge that we possess. And it's like, I, to my knowledge, was not a good public speaker. Upon doing it once, I understood that I have a knack for this and can certainly recreate it. And I had zero nerves going in. Funny enough, the day before um, I went home and I got an email two days before and they're like, how would you feel about going on the Pittsburgh morning show to talk about this, this opportunity? And it's just like, oh, I've never been interviewed on TV before either. So let's knock that one out before I give the speech, I guess. And I went on and I did like an eight minute segment on the morning, uh, on the morning news or whatever. It was just like, okay, I, I got this. Like this, that has to be way more nerve wracking than delivering a, a speech to a couple hundred people. So have you given any other speeches since that point? Is that the, is that like the big public one that you've given? That's the only one I've given, but uh, you know, it, I think it allowed me to really move forward with Salt for Why because we're doing, you know, hours and hours of talks every day. Um, and I'd love to get into that realm again moving forward. But th the only thing that hangs me up is it seems like such a bullshitty type arena, right? Like the idea of being a motivational speaker or or whatever whatever it is. Right. Like I have a ton of respect for like Tony Robbins and what he does and Gary Vee and all these guys. They're all self-made. They've all achieved greatness. But at the end of the day, it's like it's really difficult not to just say to yourself, like, who the fuck am I? And why the hell should these people care? And that was like my big reservation with dead money whenever we were talking about doing it. It's like, listen, I'm in. I think the industry needs it. I love it. I want to do it. But I'm really terrified that at the end of the day, people are just going to be like, who the fuck is this guy? So I made it like a big point of emphasis of like, listen, if we're going to do this, it has to be of the framework of, I'm an absolute unknown to everybody and we're going to build that character by the end of, of the series. Hmm. Interesting. So I guess when you think about the marketing aspect of things, then how do you decide, you know, what's too much? Because I guess if you, if the idea is to get yourself out there, you know, there's obviously a lot of platforms these days with blogs and with YouTube and Instagram, Twitter and all that stuff to potentially help, you know, even build that character even more, you know, how do you decide what you want to do or what you want to put your time into when it comes to that? For me, it's just like I gravitate towards things that interest me that I think I'm relatively good at. I feel like I present well on camera and I feel like I write well. So I write blogs and, you know, we get into as much like multimedia stuff as we possibly can. Um, for other people, it's like, you know, do what you are passionate about, do what you're good at. I don't think you can oversaturate these types of markets, right? Like people will let you know when you're, when you're putting too much out or when you're starting to do shit work, you'll hear about it. And, you know, we're just getting started from our standpoint. I haven't heard any grumblings yet. I'm sure you had a lot of the same reservations in doing a pod. It's like, how many is too many? Should you do one a week? Should you do five a week? Like, who knows? Let the audience decide. They'll tell you. Yeah, I think the, I found that the more I start caring what other people think is the more reservations I have. Whereas when I first started doing the pod, I was like, I, I don't really, I mean, I want people to enjoy it. I want to put something out there that... You know, it's on a, the conversation from poker's perspective is on a different sort of level than most of the content out there. But I was like, I'll just, I'm just going to do it because I really enjoy doing it. And I'm just going to put out as many as I want to. And yeah. And it's kind of like easy, it, right? Because there's right. no risk. Right. It's not exactly. like there's, you're no on a exactly. there's nothing to lose. There's nothing, nowhere to, nowhere to go down. There's nowhere to fall. And I think, you know, sort of what's happens obviously over time is that, well, now you start building, building, building. And now you start saying, well, you know, do I want to do this? Like I could risk losing this. And now it's like, you know, now more people on YouTube do stuff. So now, you know, there's certain people out there that view it as, you know, views are life, right? Like how many people watch your stuff? Like that's how, that's how whatever you are. And that's never really how I've thought about it ever. I've never really, you know, like gone after that. It's not never been about views, never been about like building up this big audience and sort of do putting out content like that. But the temptation's always there because you see other people doing this stuff. And then it's like, well, I mean, I, I know I could do that. It's just like, and then you hear other people talk and you hear audience talk or you hear friends bring up suggestions and sort of dealing with that thing. And then thinking about the risk uh, again, it's just that part's different now than it was a couple of years ago for myself. And that's been something interesting to deal with and 
sort of figure out and navigate? Yeah, I would say generally speaking, like we fear risking things that aren't actually at risk. Like you're you're probably not going to fall from grace because you put out some sort of shit product. You'll fall from grace when you start to try to exploit your audience, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not selling some sort of like magic potion or or snake oil. You know, so it's like as long as you're respectful to the audience, and that's really what it boils down to. That's when talking to my production team and, and stuff like that, that's really what we came to the conclusion of is largely the poker media that was out there was just disrespecting its audience. It was pandering to this profile of a guy that they want to target that may or may not even be interested. You know, the guy who plays at the VFW who doesn't mm -hmm. know what what three betting means and stuff like that. It's like you're just completely ignoring the built-in audience that you're going to obtain if you just respect them enough to give them a, a product that they can get behind. Uh, Bob Balky says, Joey sells a dream with his podcast. That's very true. I think that I think that might be true. I am. I, I would imagine that that's many not people bullshit, though. <laughs> selling some dream, whether what the dream is, I think that's up for people to interpret. And I do hear from these people, and they tell me what they interpret. And uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting stuff out there. So. It's, uh, I guess, if you think about, you know, mention that, how would you change, if at all, would you change the way that, I guess, the Square Rollerballs talked about when, when it's aired in terms of the way that they talk about the players, in terms they talk about strategy and these terms, would you, would you have it quite the same or, or how do you think you would, you would change it, if at all? Um, I think Nick Shulman is the godsend that, that commentary has been looking for. And that's no disrespect to other people that are doing it. It's just... He's so eloquent in the way that he speaks and kind of brings the people along that may not understand. And the example I like to use is I'm obsessed with shows like Fast and Loud, these car shows, right? But I don't know shit about the technical applications uh, of, of being a mechanic, of the inner workings of, of engines and things like that. You know, I, I don't understand any of that stuff outside of the buzzwords that they throw around. Like I learned what a V8 was somewhere along the line. You know, I, I learned some of these things because I cared enough to figure out what the vernacular meant. And I think Nick portrays it in a way where if the local VFW guy who doesn't know what three betting means cares enough to want to be on the same page as this well-spoken commentator, he'll look it up. And that's a great thing. That's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to further along the bottom to get to the barrier of entry, not alienate everybody who's already in the learning curve and then just try to pander to this wide audience of NASCAR viewers who may or may not give a shit. Those people are going to be stimulated visually, period. That's, that's all it's going to come down to. Do they like the lights? Do they like the sound of chips? Do they like the amount of money changing hands? Like, that's how you're going to grab their attention. Nick will retain it for you. You need a guy like Nick Shulman to retain those types of people. And mm -hmm. I think that they've just done an amazing job like retaining him as a, a commentator. Do you think you mentioned visual type things often? Do you, are you think you're a very visual guy when it comes to, you, know, you mentioned vision boards. Do you, do you write a lot of things down when you're sort of, you mentioned the whiteboard too. Mm -hmm. So are you, do you feel like you're a big visual guy? Yeah, uh, one of the exercises I like to do at the academy is uh, when we start getting into post-flop play, I ask people to close their eyes and I'll just describe a flop, like king of diamonds, three of hearts, two of spades. And I ask them, like, when I say that, do you visually see these cards or do you just, like, comprehend them from, from a, a, an audible sense? <laughs> and it's usually, like, 50-50. But, like, for me, I close my eyes and I see very vividly those three cards. Um, I'm very much a visual learner, but like in developing this material and stuff, I understand that there are four ways that people learn and not everyone's the same. So it's really important to adhere to all of them. Otherwise you lose people along the way. Hmm. Yeah. I close my eyes. I see King three. I see it in my, in my fucking mind. I, I see like every yeah. turn possible. I see all the rivers I see. Yeah. yeah so yeah. that's something we try to describe because people are like, uh, well, how do we then start to anticipate turns and rivers? I was like, well, they're finite, right? You know exactly what cards are left in the deck. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, can we create a spreadsheet? And I was like, yes, if you learn that way. Me, I close my eyes and I just see a Rolodex of cards, 
right? Mm -hmm. And I can visually pinpoint every single one that's remaining in the deck and I can match it to how it affects my hand, right? <laughs> and some people are like that, other people aren't. I was like, if you're not like that, then yes, go the route of creating a spreadsheet. You can still like very easily, uh, um, you know, use a drop down or, or use the, the two columns, whatever the case may be, and you'll arrive at all the same decision points. It's just how you learn. It's really cool hearing you explain it like this because I don't, I, mean, I guess I've never really read something or heard someone else really quite explain it like this. So it's, uh, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's something I've, yeah, I guess I've just never heard many people discuss too much. Uh, Annie Catherine says, what are the four ways people learn? Can he explain that a little bit? Man, I hope I, I hope I remember them offhand. It's visually, audibly. Um, what the fuck are the other two? Uh, through experience and like hands on. Uh, I always forget the last one. Google it. You know, Google will tell you the answer. Um, I really don't remember the the fourth one. Um, but basically, you know, it, it's it's not that people are restricted to one method of learning either. Like I personally learned very well visually um, and hands-on. Me too, and yeah. That's no surprise that those go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I also do somewhat well with memorization through just listening. Like uh, I can absorb things kind of sponge-like, but it doesn't always mm -hmm. correlate to application. Like if I, if I hear something and remember it, that doesn't mean that I'll necessarily use it correctly. Whereas if I see something and then apply it, it'll be solidified in my knowledge base. Um, so like a lot of the lectures that I, I took in throughout high school and college would go very well for me when, ta when test taking. But when it came actual time to utilize the information, it was worthless to me. Uh, the other people say it's visual, auditory, Reading, writing, and kinesic, kinesic thick. I've never actually I said this word. I that means hands on. Hands on. Okay. Yeah. Kin, I, say, I, say, I don't know. Say that. Kinesthetic. I've never said that word in my life. Kinesthetic. Yeah. Hands yeah so re reading, writing was the one that I left off. Okay. So interesting. Visual, reading, writing, auditory. Okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. I don't know. This is kind of this. Uh, this is a lot of um, you know pretty cool stuff. I, do you have do you have like one place you go to, to to learn a lot of this stuff, or is it sort of all on the drive? Right. It's all on the Google Drive. You you sort yeah. of compile things from here and you take things from here and and it's just this master Google Drive of this. Uh, this I, I've always I've always been a fan of um, you know humbly reaching out to those who are more versed in the areas that you're trying to learn about. So I had access to college professors, high school teachers, things like that, and just kind of reached out to them. It's like, hey, you have a degree in this. Why don't you uh, tell me a little bit more? I'm interested. And the thing is, is like whenever you go to people and ask them for, for advice and, and you know, certain metrics, they're, they're very happy to help, right? Because like teachers aren't put on a platform very often. And this is a scenario where it's like, I want to defer to you as the expert. And you know, that's that's a nice feeling no matter what field you're in. So I got a lot of great feedback from from all those sources. Yeah, I think most people don't do that for a number of different reasons. I know I I mean most people are kind of, I guess, independent. They feel like they want to do everything themselves, so they want to figure things out. I know for myself, I am very much like that from poker in a lot of ways. Cause something you mentioned earlier, which was that why writing for me helped me to tap into this point and you mentioned for you you had a lot of people you could discuss a lot of this stuff with and that is mm -hmm. definitely something i never had previous to really i uh, starting my uh like my gto club or and you know really i guess like bringing on bring on someone to work for me and then sort of writing more before that it was it was never any of that so you like directly hit it spot on which is why a lot of those things were sort of in my mind because i never really got them out i never right. really talked about them i never talked about all these different things and and I go going back to this is that kind of how it ties to that is that I think I don't I know just myself it, it's just I don't know what it is is that when you ask other people for for maybe help or you ask other people to to just maybe talk about something I'm not sure like why I've always been so hesitant to do that I don't know if it's uh, I actually don't know I, I don't know I've never I've tried thinking about it but I can't quite figure it out and some people maybe it's some sort of like a, a fear or it's some sort of independent type thing but I'm just not sure but I know other people like there. 
out there are like that as well, where they're just scared or they like, you know, they don't want to bother the person or all these sort of other different reasons, which holds them back from, from wanting to do that. I mean, I can take a stab at it uh, as obviously I relate to this at some point or another. Um, I think that first of all, like talking about the independent uh, mindset, I think that we have a very, I guess, like cloudy uh, application of what that really means. I think a lot of people who think that they're independent are actually quite dependent, but very prideful. Um, so generally speaking, we, we quantify our own self or like we validate ourself through the things we're able to achieve on our own. And what that often does is just like turn a blind eye to all the help and aid that we got along the way. Um, and largely like I come from Pittsburgh, we're a prideful group, right? Like I didn't understand how, how, uh, this isn't just the norm, I guess. I thought it was normal that like you took pride in where you were from. You took pride in your local teams. You took pride in, in who you were and your moral fiber and stuff like that. Uh, and then I kind of like got into the poker community where you're dealing with like a lot of highly intellectual people and you start to understand that pride is great in some ways, but a hindrance in others. And for a very long period of time, I was exactly the way that you are. Like I'm a very much an independent person and it was always, I'll do it myself. I'm too prideful to ask for help. Um, I don't need help. Uh, especially when you get into poker, you largely look down on all of your peers. You think they're all worse than you in some facet and that's how you have your edge. And it's because you can't really quantify that edge yourself. So you have to justify being in this game somehow and the fact that you're good. Uh, prior to poker, it's sports. You get into sports, you immediately start sizing yourself up against the competition and you just sit there and pick apart all the things that they're bad at and then try to correlate it to why you're good. They're all bad at this, therefore I'm better at them at all those arenas and then some. Um, all of that keeps forcing you down this path of of like losing this validation. If you ask for help, you're no longer validated as being uh, an expert or being good at something or, or whatever the case may be. Um, but in reality, you, you start to like independently or, or sorry, uh, indirectly depend upon all these outside sources. So you start like disingenuously working it into conversations, asking for advice, and you do it in a very non-humble manner. I keep saying you, I'm sorry. I'm not like trying to project this onto you, but like, no, people, it's okay. yeah, uh, like, you know, we, we start to reach out for help in a very passive aggressive kind of way. And, uh, it deteriorates a lot of just human interaction. Um, you know, there, there's, it's very difficult to have a healthy functional relationship if you're closed off to even yourself where you're not willing to admit when you need help with certain things. Um, and you know, some of it's a point of pride, some of it's just a point of fear, but like going broke strips you of all that. Um, and uh, you know, I was broke, I, I went broke from 300 K to zero between 2010 and early 2012. And the next 12 to 15 months was just literally dissecting why and what the fuck I was going to do about it. And a lot of it at first was, I don't need help. And then arriving at a point where it's like, I would love some help, but I don't have any available. And that's really where the independence starts from. It's when there's no help available, are you able to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and continue further down the path, right? So that's whenever I had my wake up call of, man, I could really use some help and there's none available. So I have to help myself. What is it that I need to do? And it became a lot of the introspective questions, uh, you know, shaking yourself, looking in the mirror, saying, how the fuck did you get to this point, man? You had everything at your fingertips. Like, what have you done? What's your plan moving forward? If, and that's, that's when I start really asking myself uh, the big question. And this is what I lead with anytime I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with somebody because everybody likes to make excuses as the reason why I'm not successful is because I don't have the same money as my competition. And it's like, I just started asking myself, if I had a half a million tomorrow, what would I do? And at first I realized I didn't have an answer and therefore it couldn't be the money that was the problem. It was me. And that's what I like to ask the, my students. It's like, okay, you think it's a money thing. If I gave you a hundred thousand dollars right now, what would you do to scale it to a million? They never have an answer. 
what if I gave you a million, what would you do? And it just becomes the office space answer of nothing, man. I would do nothing and I would love it. It's like, that's all they're aspiring to do. Their big picture goal is to just never have pressure again. And it's like, once that happens, you just succumb to the rat race. Um, the the 90 minute talk that I did when I was researching it, I came across Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that was what I used as a framework for my entire talk. And basically I was coming from the standpoint of we're we're so forced down this traditional path of get your education, meet a nice girl, get married, have a family, start a career, uh, live until retirement, scrape by and die. And that sucks. That doesn't seem like a real life, especially when it's spoon fed to you. Um, and it's all predicated on being trapped in the hierarchy of needs. So basically Maslow says that there's like five levels of needs and it starts with the most basic, which are food and shelter, clothing, um, acceptance from your social group, acceptance from yourself. And then you get into the light enlightenment phase where you finally rise above the basic needs and you start to want to leave a contribution to society and ultimately fulfill it through altruism. And the problem is nobody or people generally speaking aren't on a trajectory to reach the enlightenment phase. They're just caught in the rat race of the basic needs. They don't understand that in 2017, your food, clothing, and shelter will be taken care of as long as you're of sound mind and you're reasonably willing to help yourself. Um, and you know, all of that basically is like what made me understand what true independence is. It's getting outside of that, that hierarchy. It's, it's getting, onto a pathway towards enlightenment, um, even if you never achieve it. And it's the same thing with poker. It's like, I want to be elite. I want to be on that pathway, even if I never achieve it. I just want to make sure that I have the right goals in mind rather than these, these immediately accessible ones that in the grand scheme of things are meaningless. Having a goal of making 100,000 is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. Having a goal of having a roof, shelter, wife and kids is meaningless in the grand scheme of things. So what do you think your what do you think your goals are right now then in terms of where you want to get to? Um I mean for poker it's it's the longevity aspect of it. I want to be playing the high stakes. I want to be creating, I want to be trend setting, I want to be doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. Like I want to be the old guard to the next generation and the generation after that. Um from an impact on society aspect, it's a little more fuzzy. I just know that I want to make one. I, I don't necessarily know how that's going to happen, but I, I have a couple like targets along the way that I really want to hit. Like I'm really passionate about getting this, this like youth center community center off the ground somehow. And I don't think it's going to be a means of funding. Like I think that will be the easiest thing. Finding the money for it when it's all said and done, I think will be the, the easy step. It's going to be finding a functional way to bring all of these parties together, understanding that it's mutually beneficial for everybody that I think will be the biggest challenge. So when you think about the poker goal you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, how do you deal with the, I guess, the short term, the, the year or two? You know, if the, if, I guess if you don't have, if that's the goal, then how do you set little things along the way to sort of hone in on? You know, how do you stay focused on, on that long-term idea? Um, Oh, I think right now a lot of that's just happening through the academy. Like I'm prideful enough that I would never want to teach someone if I didn't feel like I was capable of doing so. So in order for me to be able to pass this knowledge on, it means that I have to continually work diligently to stay ahead of the curve, to prepare proper teaching metrics, to understand how it becomes transferable from my brain to theirs. Um, and that just keeps me really sharp when it comes to actually creating strategy and being able to apply it. Really interesting stuff, man. Really interesting <laughs> stuff. Really interesting stuff. It's been a, uh, it's been a fun podcast, man. I gotta say it's been a very fun podcast. Yeah. I know people yeah. out there have been enjoying a lot. I've seen a lot of good comments. Um, a lot of questions. If you guys have some questions right now that you've been, you, I have seen a couple of really good ones mentioned. And I haven't necessarily called them out. I actually haven't given you shout outs here, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give some shouts at some point in time, but I'm going to put these off a little bit here. Let me see what Jonah said. My wizard assistant is sitting right next to me who leaves comments in the chat from time to time. Shout out to Jonah. Yeah, Jonah. Jonah's a beast, man. What's up? How you doing, Jonah? You got a question, Jonah? Come here. You got, you got a question. I know you got a question. Jonah, Jonah asks some good questions sometimes. So we'll, 
you're two for two, kid. What are you talking about? You gave Perkins that good one. Remember, you know, you gave him that good one. Couldn't do a clip. What's up, Matt? What's up, buddy? Uh, it's been a great podcast so far. I don't actually have a question. More like wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the the community center that you spoke about in the beginning. Sure. About, about it, swapping in the hours of, I guess, traditional education with extracurriculars, I guess. That's what you said? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, like, I just think there's a massive gap in education right now. And I don't necessarily know how I can impact it at the national level. But I do understand that like things like charter schools are becoming more popular for a reason. And we're just greatly lacking fundamental education. I think all of us uh, who have high school degrees and, and even secondary degrees, like, uh, you know, I have my bachelor of science in computer science, can point to all the gaps in knowledge that I graduated with. They really just throw you to the wolves post high school, post college, where it's just like, okay, you're not a kid anymore. Figure it the fuck out. And it's like, you're kind of put into a position where there's no room to really uh, cultivate any sort of nonlinear path. So if you're a creative type, this is really stifling because you need to eat. And from this point forward, you're just thrust into the rat race and it's really pushed upon you that you're going to get stuck in those lower third hierarchy of needs uh, that Maslow talks about because they drive fear home that you need to provide food, shelter, and clothing. Um, and it's like, I was never meant to be a computer scientist, but if I didn't, wasn't lucky enough to fall into poker, I'd probably be humping some terrible programming job wanting to blow my fucking brains out. And that's just not a life. So I wanna create an atmosphere where we start to cultivate actual intelligence, not just IQ, but EQ. I think one of the biggest things that's lacking on on kids these days um, is emotional growth. And it's like, there's so much that we're unwilling to talk about and so many like introspective things that we encourage people to just suppress. And it's so unnecessary. So I wanna go like the functional education route. It's crazy to me that logic isn't just something that's taught from first grade on. You know, I'm not talking about one class. I'm talking about if we're gonna teach English, we should teach goddamn logic. It's wild to me, to, especially in today's day and age with social media, where ignorance is just constantly on display. It's insane to see relatively intelligent people just speak in logical fallacies over and over and over and over again. It's like, how are you not aware of this stuff? It's crazy. It's insane to me that people aren't capable of writing at the level that they speak. So many intelligent people are able to talk and converse in such an eloquent way, but then they can't transfer it over into words. Why? It just wasn't cultivated. Um, so I, I want to go that path. I want to go even more functional, right? Like not everybody is above average intelligence. Let's teach people how to, you know, figure out what their skill set is in life. Let's let's keep the or let's get the worker bees on the path to the 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 functional jobs. Um, people are complaining that technology is replacing so many of these low-level workers. Well, it's like, yeah, because there's no adaptation. We're still teaching people to to we're teaching mass population to work on factory lines when factory lines don't exist anymore, right? Let's let's create a, a let's create a generation of bridge builders, of welders, of these functional skill sets that anybody is capable of doing if they put the time and effort in. While our our uh, you know, systems around us are just absolutely crumbling. We need new roads. We need new bridges. We need new highways. We need all this stuff, and we don't have enough people to fulfill the jobs. Why? Because those that are capable are overeducated for it and feel like they can't. They have a liberal arts degree, and they're not going to get their hands dirty. And those who are willing are undereducated. We've pigeonholed them down the path of being a McDonald's or Walmart worker, and it's very unfair. So let's teach them instead how to cultivate the best skill set uh, aligned for them. And I think we're seeing a lot of this in like the Netherlands where it's easy because of homogeny and small populations. Um, you know, if we get back to creating independent communities and allow them to grow then outward, um, I think you'll see a lot of the state re re regaining control of the educational format. And hopefully we'll see things like, uh, you know, the federal implications of education with Betsy DeVos or whatever her name is, uh, we'll see that shit removed and we'll adhere back to 
letting people as a whole dictate how they're going to be educated, especially today. Everything's at your fingertips. We're in an information age. We're on the brink of a massive technological revolution. This is going to be equivalent to the industrial revolution was uh, how impactful it was back then. I mean, we really run a high risk of ruin if we continue to stay behind the times, right? This is where the shift can occur, where someone else can become a world power, where the United States now all of a sudden takes a big back seat to people because we're unwilling to change. Everybody just wants to bleed red, white, and blue and do it the way that it's always been done. And it's like, this is a massive time to take a huge step forward. And we're, we're fortunate guys like Elon Musk are, are kind of leading the way. If, if people don't listen, if people, the fact that people voted for Trump because he promised to bring back steel industry jobs being a guy who comes from a steel mill town a steel the steel city those jobs are not coming back i'm aware of it how the hell are those people like in the industry not aware it's because they're blind to it they're they're hoping for promises that can't be kept you know they're hoping that somehow this guy is going to go on a crusade to eliminate technology and and revert us back to the 70s those times have passed we have to adapt Dare I say GTO? Good answer, Jonah, for you? <laughs> Jonah says good answer. Thank you. All right. Jonah, thanks you for that question. Uh, he did ask, also ask, how far away is he from implementing this? And, or, what is the next, or what is the next step? Because the idea seems, seems solid as fuck AF. <laughs> what happens? Um, I guess from like my standpoint, uh, I, I still just need to network properly. Uh, money would help. If I had a big seven figure score, it would allow me a lot more independence where I don't have to work so hard, you know, cause I'm still growing self for why I'm still battling it out in the big game. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still, I, I still have to worry about finding backing all the time and shit like that. So I, I'm still a little bit, even though I'm on a path, hopefully towards the enlightenment, it's very fluid. And I still dip back into the lower third where I have to worry about my own personal needs too. So I'm still very much in the abstract construction phase, but I don't doubt that, you know, my network is going to reach out to another network, which reaches out to another network until I finally, I, I come in contact with the right guy. But so don't, don't you sort of improve your chances of, of meeting these people by the more you put yourself out there. So I guess the more you do yeah. things like this and the more you just do other things, I think that that gives you that the best chance at something like that. Yeah. I'm a big firm believer in not rushing the process, right? It's just like, everything falls into place when it's supposed to and mm -hmm. me getting out there and hustling, like trying to get a hold of Cuban or Gary V or someone like that to, to make this their thing. Uh, it's, it would be successful, but it's not going to have the same level of success, right? Like me reaching out to Mark Cuban tomorrow, pitching him on this idea and him saying like, yeah, that's great. Like uh, I'll put it in my portfolio and we'll get it done. That's not the same as me getting to a point where that meeting just happens organically because I'm ready. And now I don't have to pass the buck on to him and say like, hey, why don't you take the reins on this and I'll just be, I'll be the guy who oversees it, right? Instead, it's like, hey, I'm ready to take the reins on this. Do you have any interest in, in funding it? And him be like, yeah, I'm super passionate about it. I can even lend you some of my time, but like, I trust you in the process. And I think generally speaking, like, it comes to fruition when it's supposed to. And if you hustle too hard looking for the crutches and the shortcuts, it's just ultimately going to set you up for failure. Did you play the Tiger Jam tournament uh, last Friday? I did not. Um, I honestly so my, didn't, didn't even know I, about it. I had, a, I, had a quick, I had a quick story. My friend Peter had in the podcast, he played that a year or two ago and he was at Cuban's table and, and he talked about his company that he has with Fantasy Labs and Cuban invested in his company um, because of their conversation there, I believe in their meeting and afterwards. And he was there once again this year too. So I think you have to play the event next year, my friend. You have, yeah. there's like, there's no way you cannot be there the entire time and play that. You just have to, that's like the number one thing on the calendar right now for next year at this time, yeah. you gotta play that. And I'll wear this Yinzer shirt. He'll find, he'll see me immediately. Cause he's just, you know, he's, he's a Pittsburgh guy himself. He'll find me and be like, oh my God, you're from Pittsburgh. I'm like, yeah, I'm from Pittsburgh. I got this great idea and that's it. It'll just seal the deal. Um, I honestly didn't even know about it. I, I wish I had. I would have happily gone down. Fuck, man. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I saw him again this year, and they were next to each other at the table. And I think Peter actually ended up winning the event somehow. So 
I don't know. I, I don't charity sure. tournaments, man. Those are those are crapshoots and sort of fun, and everyone's drunk and you're going all in, and it's yeah. it's a it's an interesting time, and it's a good way to meet people, though, for sure. It's a good way to network and meet people that you would just never have a conversation with and never like just come across really outside at a poker table outside of these events like that. Yeah, I'd like to see a lot more of that kind of stuff happening in the industry. Um, maybe not necessarily charity tournament wise, but like just anything that brings all walks of life of uh, successful people together. Um, I know the the GPI awards like try to do it on some level, but it's tough. It's still very, very pigeonholed into just the poker industry. Um, there are a lot of people who are successful in other realms that are interested in this game. And to be able to open up avenues and venues where we can brush elbows with them, I think that you know the the higher thread people in our community will cross over very well into other communities. And that's important. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what the hope is for some new things like this happening or new gatherings or new anything because outside of the, you mentioned GPI, which I think that, yeah, I mean, you're, you're pretty much right that I guess this year was much smaller and there really wasn't anyone outside of the poker industry that was there. And even a lot of poker industry wasn't there this year because they just scaled it back so much. So. Yeah, it would be interesting to see more gatherings or anything like that. But what those would look like, I guess we haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Or what it could be, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it could be. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it happens in other industries, right? Like you, uh, this is a, a stretch of a comparison, but like when you're talking about the ESPYs, it's not just athletes there. It's not even close. That's a hot ticket for everybody. Grammys, whatever, Oscars. Um, certainly, an award show, I don't think, is going to be the path. But there has to be some sort of like lateral shift off of an award show that would interest a lot of like poker enthusiasts. And maybe it is just running tournaments. I don't know. Um, maybe it's like having some sort of like ball where there's a secondary tournament. Like, you know, like it's a dinner and a dance type thing where it's kind of formal. And if you want to play, there are tables you know, for people to go play at whatever. I, I don't know. Um, kind of, I guess I'm thinking like James Bond style. <laughs> Focus like every, I know Sam, if you're out there, now you got an idea for next year's Super Roller Bowl around that time, maybe before, the week after. I mean, now that's a... That's know, actually, again, you might've just nailed it, really. Honest to God, like that would be so big because if they invite a few people outside the industry to play the event itself, but make it like a gala weekend, where Friday and Saturday are like these happenings. Maybe Friday's a charity event and Saturday's like a dinner and a ball type thing where it's just really, really black tie affair. People people are all about elitism, you know? Like they want to be a part of that small club and it's just a great avenue for for cross promotion amongst uh, different, different, I guess, environments. And that's big for Poker Central, right? Like they're trying to get advert from way, way way bigger people than just those who are advertising currently in the poker industry. Yeah, I think if Maury is too, I mean, Maury talked about really big things coming next year's entire presentation of the Super High Bowl, much, much different, grander scale, something that we've never seen in poker before. So I don't know what exactly this means, but I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> excited to find out. We might have just put the gabosh on their uh, their big reveal for a year from now. <laughs> Could have been it. I don't know. They might have been. Honestly, there. I, I have no idea. Like, I didn't even realize they were planning on changing anything. But man, I hope it does go that path. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like Poker Central now with with all the stuff they're doing. They're promising a hundred days of live poker, much more high stakes cash games, mixed games, PLO, no limit, etc. It does seem like they have some pretty grand ideas. I feel like the moves they made so far have been have been pretty good. And I mean, I guess that's really the hope right now is that is that they can decide to develop something. And, and you know, with Kerry Katz behind the whole entire operation, I feel like he certainly is a guy who can make that happen. And he's had success. I mean, you know, he's made a, a very large amount of money in the industry that he's been in and, and, and uh, with the school loans, which is a, that's a whole other subject altogether. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually optimistic about most things in poker, even though they don't always come to be, you know, shout out to the uh, GP, uh, GPL season one. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah yeah no I'm, I'm the same like i it's in a lot of ways like you could be optimistic and still be objective like with the gp with the gpl i wanted it to succeed for sure mm -hmm. i didn't opt i didn't opt in like i just didn't see the incentive for players uh, i didn't see the path for the success 
And it's like, you can want something to succeed without actually aligning yourself with it because you're objectively thinking that it won't. Uh, and I think that happens all the time, like especially in our industry where here's the, here's the one thing that we really need to get across to the community as a whole and have people start buying in because I think largely they don't believe it. Poker very much is in its infancy. Uh, it's it's a very, very complex game. It's only been around in a popular form for about a decade. Uh, there's just a lot of moving parts and a lot is going to continue to change in this environment before we can wholeheartedly just say like, okay, poker has become a tired old sport. Um, I compare it a lot to baseball. Like baseball was largely the same for the better part of a century. And then people started crunching the numbers and it just immediately changed. Uh, you saw this, the, the same happen with basketball where the three-point shot was implemented for two decades. Nobody really examined it. And then all of a sudden, Horolibus starts making a living off the fact that he understands the teams who shoot threes from the corner shoot at a much higher percentage. And now all of a sudden, the three-point shot has become the dunk. You know, it's, it's, it's glorified. It's revolutionized the game. The NFL is now a passing league where for three decades, it was a defense run first league. This stuff happens and poker is going to go through the same sort of uh, calm before the storm. And I think we're still very much in the infancy of it. We're just start, starting to scratch the surface as to how deep down the rabbit hole this game goes. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface in if it's marketable. Well, it's an interesting thought, I guess. <laughs> Something I never thought about because obviously most people you hear, they say well, poker's it's, it's solved. Now, it's solved. Yeah. Like limit po poker solved. Norman Holmes is going to be solved soon. Pop them in Omaha. They're going to figure out the way to do PLO, and all the bots are taking over. Online's dying. This and that, and this and that. And well, you know, that's the problem, right? We're, the yeah, well, we're equating the apocalyptic nature of online to the game as a whole, and it didn't originate online, and it's not going to end online. Right. Uh, the online game certainly can rise and fall very quickly without it having much of an impact in the live realm. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm such an online guy. So when I think about poker, you know, you mentioned live guy and you just play a lot online, but mainly live recently. And I, I you know, I played a little bit of live, played some of the PLO events last year and, and some cash games, but definitely not much live experience for me. So sort of that whole entire world and, and what it's like to, to you know, be a live player just outside of after Black Friday before I moved to Canada and then some live sessions along the way. I don't, you know, I guess I just don't have that that, that same level of understanding of it that, you know, primarily live players do have. So for me, I'm, you know, I kind of associate the online poker world with the poker world in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I sort of forget that it's thriving outside of that. And there's a lot of action everywhere. It seems to be only getting bigger and bigger live. So tournaments you know, are bigger that. now than they ever have been. I mean, we're seeing a high roller circuit that has not just come to exist, but like it's flourishing. There's maybe, 50 high roller events a year mm -hmm. that's a lot there might be more i don't know there's like 10 plus 100 k's um and it's certainly not a product of of uh, of inflation or anything like that i mean the economy is doing a lot better but not to that level um and you know the the mid stake series like the 1500s the 3500s they're drawing record number fields uh people care about the game people want the game to thrive it's just a matter of aligning everybody's interest. And I think that's become very difficult. <laughs> and good. I don't see that getting easier, but no. you know, we'll, we'll kind of... Uh, Fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll see how that one goes there. So I guess Super Bowl Roller Bowl coming up here. You know, it only took us a little bit, a couple hours into the pod to talk about Super <laughs> Roller Bowl here right now. So how are you feeling, man? You know, it starts in uh, Sunday. The player pool has been announced, except for one I believe is mysterious. because Bobby Baldwin dropped out. So hopefully it's a... I don't know who they're going to replace him with. I'm not really sure. I don't have any inside knowledge on that one. But how are you feeling about the event this year? Um, good. I'm pumped. I have way too much of myself. Uh, so I pretty much have to win. I, oh. <laughs> I have 70% of myself this year, which is just too goddamn much. Um, but, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm so prepared for it. Like, I almost, like, started prepping – immediately after last year's ended and just haven't really stopped. Um, we've been trying to branch out to the tournament path as well next year at the, at the Academy. So we wanted to build out that whole process. It's all laid out in my mind. I haven't dumped it off into the drive yet, but 
you know, most of that is uh, it's really transferable to the to the event coming up. I've been working closely with Elliot per usual, um, mostly just getting over the fact that I'm putting up so much of my net worth to to play this stupid thing. Um, and it's really not even me g getting comfortable with that. It's more of coming to grips as to why I'm such a psychopath who keeps doing this. Uh, but Matt, Matt, why are you such a psychopath that keeps doing this? Well, that's a great question for for me uh, to ask you. I guess like uh, I guess for me, it's just like a strike while the iron's hot kind of thing. I I don't know how many of these opportunities are going to be presented, and I'm certainly not going to be playing like a million dollars worth of binds this year. So. If I'm only going to be playing, if I'm only going to have these shots once in a blue moon, um, I feel like it's important to try to put myself in a position to capitalize as much as I can. And that was the only unfortunate aspect of last year. It it alleviated a lot of my makeup, but I only it wasn't even my biggest live score as far as like my take home. I only had twenty percent of myself, hmm. um, and that was kind of regrettable because I could have done a lot with 1.1 million. But, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. It was a huge opportunity in a lot of other ways. Um, I just want to be sure that, like, when these chances present themselves, I have, I have the ability to move forward because the path to a million to 10 million, uh, like, from where I'm at now, from where I'm at now to not be worth seven figures is almost, like, embarrassing, I think. And the path to a million seems like clear. The path to 10 million seems impossible. And I feel like this suddenly brings it into uh, a clear perspective where it's like, yeah, if you're successful at this thing you've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into, now all of a sudden you're halfway to that unobtainable goal. This sounds like exactly no gamble, no future, like my Asian ancestors say to yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Like grandma, like grandma, no gamble, no future. That's right. I've, I've been living and dying by that for uh, for 12 plus years now. 70%, huh, kid? If you're just you're saying you're going out there, you're saying, fuck it, man. I mean, what? So, Iron. I mean, I, you could always say, you know, if you can always, if you can get staked for things, if you can get staked to play play cash games, you're never, you're never broke, really. I mean, you could say you are broke, I guess. Yeah, it was either that or a house. And like, rent is so cheap in Vegas. Well, what the hell do I want to get tied up into a, a big commitment like that for, you know? <laughs> I see the pros and cons, you know. Pros and cons. <laughs> <laughs> but think about when you win, kid. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, think about the house we get then. You know, exactly. it, it'll actually have a pool. Oh my god, you don't got a pool? You're not no, renting no, a pool? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. The place we're renting is stupid. It's it's my bedroom itself is eighteen hundred square feet. Uh, it's just it's dumb. That's a big ass bedroom. What do you need eighteen hundred square foot bedroom for? I don't. It just came with the house. Uh. It's it's like a studio apartment. Um, yeah, the place is huge. We're we're on like three quarters of an acre. We have a massive like backyard with basketball hoop, grotto, pool, all this stuff. And we pay between five of us, we pay five k total a month. It's like free. Yep, that's yeah, that's cheap. I agree. Yeah, it's 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 free. Uh, the dogs love it. What more could you ask for? That's a GTO setup right there, and I don't. I think I proper proper usage of the word in that spot. That's yeah. definitely. A good sure. spot there. So we got the event Sunday. Going to be streamed Sunday. Let me stream Sunday, Monday. There's three days Tuesday. Were there three days last year? Or was it two days last year? Uh, of the stream? Yeah. It was just two, I think. But I think it's being streamed the whole way through now. Right. It's being streamed the entire way through. And I just wasn't sure if it was three days last year or two days last year. I, I didn't quite remember if that was what it was. or if they Because I know they added in players. So maybe they added another day this year. And uh, this year, so this year the structure is uh, five days instead of four, and it plays down to the final seven on day three, and then from seven to three on day four, and then three to a winner on day five. Jesus fucking Christ! Okay. And I guess uh, speaking with Carrie, that that was for NBC's sake, for uh, for TV. Mm -hmm. It's just like, yo, know, it allows people. Because I think like it got exhaustive last year whenever it got down to like the final three, which is when people should be carrying the most. Right. And it's like six hours into the broadcast. Um, oh. So I think they wanted to split that up to, to regather people's attention. Yeah, that makes sense, especially with last year's kind of how that went down to. Yeah. yeah I got to check out. I'm going to check what times. So is that airing on 
Poker Go and also NBC Sports. I guess I probably should know this, but I don't. I don't know this. The, the, the way I understood it, it's only going to be on Poker Go, and then they're going to um, edit the pieces down to like the actual shows on NBC Sports sometime either later in the summer or early fall. Mm. Sam, get in touch with me, man. Tell me what the fuck's going on. Come on, buddy. I gotta... I'm, I'm pretty confident in that, but I'm not 100%. I got to know for the week, Sam, what's happening. Please. I know he's out there. He's got a Brent. Hit me up. Come on. Tell me what's happening with this stuff, man. I don't know. I'm, conf I'm confused, but most people are probably confused out there. So sure. I guess, uh, I don't know. I'm excited to watch it, man. I, I was saying last year, man, I don't know. I don't. I never watch no home tournaments. Except, I mean, main event I watch, you know, obviously, you know, Willie Kasu, most popular poker player in the world, was on this last year. So, of course, I was tuned in. But this, I'm like super excited to watch this, man. I'm just excited to rail it. I love that they changed out the players. It seems like people are talking and everyone's dressed all nice. Obviously, you, you got, you probably, you probably got a new suit picked out. Hope you went to Tom Ford oh, yeah. over there at the mall and picked out something fancy. I can't. Yeah, we got new threads. <laughs> what you got? You got some colors in store for us? I, I like the last year's, man. It was looking fly. Yeah, I'm, I'm opening it up with a creamsicle uh, blazer day one. And you got, so you got, you got different ones for each day. Oh yeah, I'm all planned out all the way through. That's okay. I like it, man. I like it. I mean, you got to look good when you're on the show, right? You're going to be on a 300K yeah, like, you want to be representing. Yeah, national TV. Like, who's going to show up in sweats other than Nick Petrangelo? Yeah, I mean, what Coleman <laughs> wore, I, guess, sweats. I guess Coleman wore, he at least wore that white sweater, I believe, last year. So hopefully he doesn't do that whole bathrobe thing again. I'm not sure what exactly happened then <laughs> with him and Dan. I don't know why they're in bathrobes. I'm, I'm going to find out soon, though, from, from Dan Coleman. So we'll see. But it's the culture. They did it for the culture. <laughs> for the culture how I'll, I'll, I'll totally with the times to do it for the culture over there in uh in monaco or monica whoever it was at so but yeah man we're uh we're very excited about that are you gonna are you gonna you suggest people maybe buy some stock of you on poker shares i'm not sure what they got yet over here i mean they got me at 1.12 i'm selling it face if they're really looking for a deal uh, um but yeah i'm going to win i have to i told you i have too much of myself like there's just no way i can lose it's it's already written in the stars all right jonah put a note down i'm all in on i'm all in on that uh <laughs> tell timex we got to go we can't break tos we got to go around we got to go around the circumventions but put it all put it all on berkey i'm in <laughs> fuck it man you're in too let's do it man whatever man i'm in <laughs> I'm in, man. I'm, let's I'm go. Let's, let's blow this thing apart. Fuck. Start from scratch, you know? Exactly, man. Lose it all. Whatever, man. I'll go, I'll go do a pod for some company. I'm sure somebody yeah. will hire me at this point, right? I'll reach out to all the sites. I mean, <laughs> my God, we'll find something out there. <laughs> we need a floor to sleep on? Yeah, you're right. We'll go stay at my mom or something like that. Shout out to my yeah. mom. I know she's out there. So uh, we'll fight. We'll take one or two more questions, then we'll uh, we'll wrap this up with, uh, with Matt. So, Matt, people want to find you. You got... You got the Instagram that you do a little bit on. You got yes. your Instagram and Solve for Wise Instagram. You have both for Twitter, I believe, too. And then more YouTube content. Been putting on some video blogs as well for uh, Solve for Wise. It, we're kind of, where can they where can they go to spot you? Uh, yeah, so all social is Berkey11 or uh, Solve for Why Academy. Uh, with the exception of YouTube, it's just Solve for Why. So our YouTube page is just Solve for Why. Um, we just released our third vlog a few days ago um and we're gonna try to do it weekly as best we can it's just turnaround time is tough um let me ask you a question what did you think about the whole uh heads up challenge that we did on twitch oh i think um i don't i never go on twitch but i do know about it because i know one of, i know my boy B, B hanks was in that too so yeah. tell me more about it. what was what, what was the format of, of it uh so we didn't really know why we were doing it. We just thought it would be cool because we have an RFID table at our, our use. And we just started twitching and we figured like, hey, let's give people a behind the scenes look as much as we can. Um, so I invited 16 people, guys like Sylvia, Osmus, um, myself, Brent, Dan O'Brien, uh, just you know, a bunch of, of local guys that I've become friends with throughout the year. We played uh, like a March Madness style uh, 16 man field and leading up to it we ran a competition on twitch where you could fill out your brackets and the winner got a third of a percent of me in the super high roller and second best bracket got uh a uh, 0.17 percent of me in the super high roller um so basically the format was we played 510 100 big blind with a 10 dollar ante so huge ante and the thought behind it was that 
you basically would be forced to play out of position a ton because the Andy's so large. And it was really good. Almost every match was about an hour on the dot. Uh, and, you know, it was great because I won the whole fucking thing. Rig- rigged, of course, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, wait, you won. Okay, so you won the entire thing. Was there people put up money? I, got, I don't know if that's illegal. Of course, I, oh. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, break no. it. It's uh, it's it's fine. We didn't we didn't break, so I'm pretty sure that makes it okay. And if not, like fuck me, I guess. But uh, we we just did five bu- five hundred bucks a man. It was four k to first, two k to second. Everyone got their money back for third and fourth. They they use play money out there, guys. Yeah, uh, yeah, five hundred dollars play money. Five hundred dollars play money. Uh, represented side bets, by, if you will. Yeah, yeah, side bet, a side bet, a side bet, guys. Come on, you guys know the out there watching right now. Allegedly, allegedly, this time I don't remember. I didn't see it, nothing, man. I didn't see it take place. I don't know anyone saw it took place. Allegedly, this happened. I I assume it's okay because Poker Night in America ran the Twitch game out of a house in Vegas. So I can't imagine when we were playing one tenth of the stakes that it would be a problem. You never know, man. There, there. I saw a story. They, they broke down a grand uh, old person's game oh, yeah, retirement home, man. I'm, I don't know. I don't know what's happening now. I'm. You never know these days what they're gonna that's find true. out of pocket or out of line stuff like yeah, that. That's so, true. That's true. But that sounds like. A, I mean, with the RFID table, you're able to do so much really cool stuff and able to create a lot of in-house content that's incredibly yeah. unique too. So I, I love that idea. I like the way of you you worked and engaged the the audience with it with the bracket style challenge. And who doesn't love filling out a fucking bracket? I mean, let's be honest here. Yeah. You give it a bracket in front of me. I'm gonna fill it out. I don't know if I know. I'm not gonna know some of the teams in March Madness sometimes, but I'm gonna fill fill the bracket out. I'm gonna yeah, put it for sure. That. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like you know, it's just another thing that we hope that can turn into something. Like you know, we're just throwing a bunch of shit against the wall and seeing what will stick. And this is one of the ideas. Uh, another one we had was maybe doing. Do you remember the all hands revealed uh, thing that Run It Once did, where they had all nine pros play a sit and go? Yep. Uh, and then they had each other perspectives. We're thinking about maybe doing something like that shorthanded uh, on the RFID table, like actually live, where we're, we're basically running through maybe a four or five handed sit and go where we're all giving our thoughts on every single hand. So that be, I mean, you could also make that produce content as well too, where you could have it live be one hand and then you could also turn that into after content too. Where people no, I, I, I meant produce, like oh, very, produce. very okay. Very much mimicking what what they did on run at once where it's like every time a hand is dealt you're gonna get five perspectives on what's happening that'd be cool i mean that'd be i, I mean there's like honestly i i guess i've never thought about ideas because i've never had an rfid table in front sure. of me you know so it brings a whole different type of of ideas you could create in terms of training in terms of entertainment in terms of combining the two i mean from heads up shorthanded tournament cash there's so many like really cool ideas and really cool directions you could go with it and I guess it's just a matter of right, like choosing choosing the ideas. I mean, I'm I always have a ton of ideas. I I mean, I have my shop my notebook right here. I have this notebook full of ideas in here. So okay. then it's a matter of well, then then what do you which one do you pick, right? Like they're yeah, all yeah. Kind of, how do you because they're all time consuming. Right, and that's like the most difficult part. But like you know, I'm sure you know this too. It's like when you have a team around you, it's more of just like you throw an idea out, whichever one piques everybody's interest the most, you just go forward with it. Because, like, especially from my standpoint, I need them to be on board. I, I can't just drag them through the mud. It's too difficult. Right. How many guys do you have working with you right now? Outside of, outside of, uh, I know there's the three of you guys, the main, and then do you have people under you that are that do other work? No, just the production crew. Uh, shout out Cook Street. They're the best. Um, so it's actually just a two man crew. But man, they're the fucking best. They did that entire Dead Money series by themselves. Shot it all themselves. Edited it all themselves. Um, you know. They outsourced for sound and color, but that was it. Well, I hope Poker Central took care of them, man. Well, they took care of me, and I took care of them. Oh, okay, I hope Poker Central took care of somebody in this situation, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. That was that was an interesting uh, procedure too. I had obviously never sold a show before, so like, I I pitched it to Poker Central last April, and we spent months just like negotiating price, negotiating, because they went through a bunch of changes themselves. Their platform right. changed numerous times. So this was initially a five episode television show that then turned into a 10 part, three minute each episode web series that then turned into what what you see today. So like, it was a really interesting learning path, like being on this side of it, having to reach out to a bunch of different people where it's like, uh, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't even know where to begin to look. So you work in the TV industry, help. (laughs) 
Um, you know, I mean, again, poker, there's really not many places to reach out to get something like that out there. There, I mean, I, I know there's a new Canada company called Poker Vision that they're securing content now and they're putting, creating their own new shows and they're one way. Mm -hmm. Poker Central, obviously, you know, they're making the great rise right now. But outside of that, there's really nowhere else to look. Right. Say, hey, I got this idea. I got this thing. You know, I have this here. What can we do about it? Yeah. You know, most people can't offer you any money for it. They're like, I mean, we can maybe give you a platform, but right. we can't necessarily. And basi pay it for basically, it. when we came up with it, it was like, let's make this for Vice and right. have that be our target. And when we fail, hopefully, like we fall amongst somebody else. And, you know, we didn't fail ending up with Poker Central. It actually just worked out where they became the most natural outlet immediately. And we never even like considered anything larger. But yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Like when you start to lean on your network, how fast you find people to, to come to a solution. Uh, I reached out to a college friend who um, I knew was in the industry. She worked for like TBS and a couple other major networks along the way. And I was just like, hey, I've never pitched anybody on this stuff before. Like, why don't you help me out? She's like, yeah, let me listen to it. And I, I gave her my pitch the night before I was supposed to meet with Poker Central. And she's like, wow, this is really good. Like, I don't know anything about poker, but this is really interesting to me. I think like it's going to be successful. Uh, she's like, why don't I put you in touch with one of my really good friends? She actually owns a an advertising company where she does a lot of uh, stuff with, with like uh, short form media like this. I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So she gives me her friend's name. I shoot her an email, go through the whole thing. Very like thankful, like, I know you're so busy, yada, yada, yada. And the next morning I wake up, get ready for the pitch. I don't hear anything back from her. And I'm just like, oh man, that's so brutal. Go on the pitch. She's the first person who says hello to me. Poker Central actually reached out to her uh, as a partner to get them advertising for the platform that they were going on. And she's like, hey, it's Rebecca. I hope you understand that like I couldn't answer you because there's a conflict of interest but just know that you already sold me you don't even have to pitch me anymore like i'm just here to listen and it's just like oh man this is wildly coincidental but it's like such a small world you know everybody knows everybody and like you just end up getting tied tied in on it all that's one of the weirdest fucking things i've ever heard right there it man. Was crazy what as fuck what in the hell are you doing that's crazy you like this woman that's literally works in the office next to the girl that i reached out to and she's on the pitch call with Poker Central the next day. That's cr I don't even know how it's possible. That's yeah, that was wild. crazy stuff. But like it, it ended up taking me down a rabbit hole of like where I was able to reach out to people who did know how to sell a show and like how to price it and stuff like that. And you know, we we came to pretty reasonable terms. I think that's awesome, man. I can't wait. I uh, I think I have a I think I have I mean I went I have a show what I'm a part of on Poker Central. I guess it's not a show. They're gonna put it into the micro content, I believe, but. We already recorded a couple episodes. I think like five. I actually don't know how many clips we're gonna put into. We'll see what they've come up with. So might be some more of that too. So I'm definitely excited to see how that turns out. I'm very excited to to check out the show. I'll probably, probably, we'll probably me and Jonah will probably watch tonight, man. You want to watch tonight? Get on there. What's that promo code? What's that promo code, Matt? What was that code, Matt? S number four Y. S four Y. You guys couldn't just make some fucking easy. You got to go S for a sci-fi. What do you, what do you S four Y? Huh? Uh, it's it's my fault. Sam wanted to just do Burke, and that probably would have been better. But I, I wanted to like tie it to solve for Y somehow. Branding. There you go. Yeah. S four Y. I mean, listen. At, now it now it stays with me because I know what it means. Solve for Y. I didn't yeah. think first. Uh, now now Burke probably would have been good too. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you need two. You need two. I'm, I two. I'm just the worst with like abstract shit. Like our logo. I fucking love it. And I showed it to like whenever we were coming up with ideas, I showed it to 10 people and like three or four were like, I get it. This is really good. And then the other seven are just like, what is this? I, I don't understand. I go, you know, the thinking man, they're like, okay, yeah. What about it? I'm like, well, he has the equation in his, in his thought bubble and it spells out self for why they're like, uh, no one's going to get that. That's stupid. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care if they get it. As long as they even ask, it's good. Like, right. It makes people, you know, remember it. If they have to ask a question as to what it means, that's not always the worst thing in the world, even though marketing would dictate that it's terrible. Yeah, when people say, what's GTO mean? I'm like, well, yeah. let me, hey, sit yeah. down. Let me tell you what GTO means. I'm like, well, it means. It's like you got a lifetime? I'm about to take you down a path, buddy. <laughs> have a seat here, John. I'm going to tell you about what GTO means here. I'm like, basically, it's whatever's optimal for you, man. Whatever, you, it's, it's, this glass of water is GTO for me to be drinking right yeah. now, so. You know, simple, easy. Yeah, you do you lifestyle. 
Exactly. You do what you want to do. I mean, yeah, you know, that's what everyone's kind of doing automatically, though. So uh, shout out to Yayo in the chat, Mr. Yayo. All I know is Yayo Mark Klang out there. Uh, shout out to Mark. I don't know if you got, I don't know what's happening with the situation, Mark, but I hope things are going okay. I'm sure you'll be in the World Series of Poker this year. And uh, hopefully you're you're staying. I mean, I don't hope, I mean, hopefully you're staying clean, man, right? Hopefully you're staying clean out there. So you want to get some shout outs, Matt? You want to get some shout outs to wrap this thing up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I pretty much just want to say thanks to all those people who are like close around me. The the production crew were amazing. Justin uh, and Travis, they're literally the best in the business. I hope this opens a ton of doors for them. Um, Christian, Jordan, uh, my good friend, Brian LaManna, who were a big part of this project. I uh, really appreciate everything that they've done for me. And then just the other big group of close friends that uh, are always there, that always show up, you know, you final table or I final table things, anybody in our group final tables things, there's a crowd of 25 and, and we brought them all. And that's just like really invaluable. You can't, can't find that kind of camaraderie at, at your mid thirties. That's true. Uh, a couple guys in the chat want to know about this. And I, I'm actually curious kind of too about this now that we've talked, okay. now that we've talked more. What does Matt know about getting any? Does Matt know anything about getting girls? Now I'm kind of curious too about this. What's your What's your approach to this, Matt? Because I mean, listen, man, you seem like you know, uh, got a lot of knowledge and things on your mind. I gotta imagine when it comes to meeting women in Las Vegas, not gonna be necessarily coinciding with some of the ladies out there. So what's uh? No, that's true. Uh, honestly, like, uh, Vegas is a really, really antisocial city. It's tough because like it. It's not like a lot of the other places I lived where there's like kind of uh, a certain culture to it where it's just easy to have common ground, you know, like you go to Pittsburgh and it's like whether it's the sports teams or uh, even just the homogeneity of the ethnic groups around there. It's like, oh, you're Italian. I'm Italian. Like, you know, there's always a jumping off point here. It's just like, so what brought you to Vegas? Uh, and generally the answer is industry. So either you're in the industry or you're not there's a lot that conflicts there it's like and then shockingly i never thought this was gonna be an issue for me but the fact that i don't drink and have never drank uh is a real challenge some girls are just like i really respect that but i can't date you because <laughs> they're you know they're just not really comfortable exposing themselves like that in a scenario where the other person isn't inebriated too i guess right um and then other girls will like go the route of oh that's so cool i wish i could do the same like total respect it's not a big deal but as time goes on it starts to present itself as a challenge because they like the idea of uh me being on the straight and narrow and, and honestly like i'm i'm genuinely the least judgmental person in the world i don't i'm so used to, like i have a group of friends that i've known since kindergarten and some of them are just like people you wouldn't introduce to your your parents if your life depended on it and others are just like you know some of the most refined human beings you're gonna come across whatever it's like i go through the spectrum I, i'm friends with a myriad of people i don't care i i genuinely enjoy human companionship um so if you want to get fucked up in front of me like whatever i don't care enjoy yourself i'm it's a judge-free zone but i think that that like constant pressure of feeling like somebody's looking down on you for having another sip weighs on people so um yeah i don't know i've been on hundreds of first dates and i've been on tens of second dates uh grinder, kid. you're a grinder out yeah. there uh when i was broke man i was really on the on the dating scene and then whenever i got funding again i got passionate about all other aspects of life so i i really try to maintain as best of a balance as i can um you know i'm i'm somebody who i'm not really into like the shallow encounters so if i don't see it going anywhere i'm not going to keep somebody around um matt yeah. i think i know what the answer is for you and i don't know how much you explore this avenue but it's called importing you got it <laughs> you, you meet you meet the women from elsewhere and yeah. you either import them they make the in call maybe you get them there for a couple some time period and then you, you maybe get them to stay i i think i i don't know man i feel like that if you're going to stay in vegas for a while that is that might no, be an that's, avenue that's, to explore that's fair um yeah I, I don't know i met a girl three years ago we dated for the better part of a year she's probably the only person that i can genuinely say i was in love with and we still keep in pretty close contact even though she doesn't live here anymore so maybe that would be the import that uh that i go down 
Listen, man, import, importing and exporting is the area I know about quite well. Quite well man. Hey, sure. you gotta, listen, man, you move around, you live in places, you got to import. Vegas, you know, unless you like the strippers or you like the, the TGG Taurus girl grind, you know, you got, I don't know. Yeah, right. Vegas is a nightmare when it comes to all things social, not just like girls, but even just like uh, making good friends outside the poker community. It's so, so difficult. Yeah, with most people out there, I imagine being in the industry or being, I mean, probably just obsessed with money, status, power, those sort of things. And that's probably what most people are after. And yeah, I guess, how it's, would you meet other people who weren't necessarily, I don't know, how are you, what are you going to meet? I guess executives or maybe people that work for companies, but where are you going to meet those people at? Maybe yoga. I don't yeah. know. It could be a thing. And, that, and that's the thing. It's like, you just don't share the common ground. It's like, I, I have a lot of people who are very successful in my phone. But they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s. They're established, you know. They're not looking to to hang out at a barbecue on a Saturday. And it's like I meet a lot of people through sports. I'm in a bunch of leagues out here. But again, it's like they have one of two lives. Either they're caught in the hustle of the industry and they just want to obsess about the car you drive and and the stakes that you're playing, or they're teachers and they just can't for the life of them understand your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And there's just like no real overlap. Do you consider moving outside of Vegas at some point in time then? Man, I love Pittsburgh to death. Like, I miss it every day. Um, I just don't know I could ever move back unless I was starting a family. Because it's still such a traditional city. Even though it's like going through a massive technological facelift with the CMU robotics department, Google having headquarters there, Uber launching their driverless fleet. Like, it's moving in that direction and it's drawing in a younger crowd for sure. But at the end of the day, it's like it's still a nine to five city. Everything shuts down at 9 p.m. And it's like after living in Vegas for a decade, I need to be able to get a steak at midnight on a Wednesday if, uh, if I'm craving a steak at midnight on a Wednesday. <laughs> how much uh, how much Gary Vee do you watch? You watch all do you watch all the Daily V stuff and all uh, everything he puts a lot of stuff he puts out? Here's my take on Gary V. I love him because he's so raw and real. I hate him because uh, a lot of his message is just really founded in. I busted my ass and I'm a grinder and that was successful. So it will work for you too. Um, so I watch enough to be exposed to it because I think that there's a lot of good th nuggets that he has. It's painful for me to listen to him tell a 21 year old to be patient and just grind their dick off a hundred hours a week. And by the time they're 35, they'll be successful. Like I think very much the opposite. I think you should try everything in your twenties because it's when you're most protected and it's when you can, just afford to fail over and over and over again so that when you do reach your 30s, you'll be on a trajectory to success. Um, so yeah, it's a give and take. He's not my favorite guy when it comes to all that stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. Uh, again, E.T., man. He, he came from the gutter. I like that. Uh, I like that. I think that there's a lot of power in empathy. And I think in order to possess empathy, you have to come from some sort of understanding of people who have it worse off than you. So whether you've actually experienced it yourself directly or indirectly, I think that that's just a certain skill that uh, is really necessary for for highly evolved people, I guess. Yeah, kind of going back to what you said about Gary Vee, because I listen to a lot of Gary Vee stuff. He stopped ET's Eric Thomas, by the way, guys. You can look him up. He puts out a lot of really great, really great videos. Very passionate guy. A lot of energy, and uh, yeah, he's he's he does really great stuff. And me and jo Jonah loves Gary V. He he like Jonah's like we're getting him on the pod. I say listen, we'll try to get him on the pod. You know, we're, we're trying. We're, we'll get him on the pod yeah. one day. I, I'd make a prep that we'll have him on at some point in time. But but yeah, you mentioned kind of V tells a young person, twenty one year old, to grind their dick off, which is exactly what he says. And then by the thirty five, be successful. You know, I kind of just think about. You know, you said kind of experience things and fail things. And I think about myself and my own my own path with poker. I started playing when I was, I think, officially 22, and that's pretty much all I did for the, I mean, since, I don't know, until up, up until maybe like last August. That's essentially all I did. I traveled, I lived in different countries, but I just played poker, and that was all I really wanted to, to, to excel at and, and become as best as I can and make a lot of money and get to the high stakes. And I think that's sort of the path I, I took where, and that's probably why I can, you know, why a lot of his material for me, I watch it, you know, it, it catches with me is because that's the exact way I did it. I just grind and grind and grind and grind and grind and put in work, focused on it, focused on it, and just sort of sacrifice yeah. a lot of other things. And it's not that that's not a path to success because it certainly is, but it's also mm -hmm. a path to burnout. And uh, it doesn't allow for much more of a wider 
perspective. So like you had amazing experiences throughout the course of all that, I'm certain, right? Like you got to see the world as a 20 something and not many people could say that, mm -hmm. but, but how much of it did you actually capitalize on? Like how much of those broad experiences did you actually get to experience as a 20 something who was thrust into a really unique opportunity versus just grinding your dick off while there. Right. And that's always wow. been my thing. I haven't done a lot of traveling because I never wanted to start a Euro trip and just play and live in a casino the whole time. Right. Because I think that's like really spitting in the face of the opportunity. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's very true. I think back to my Australia times, outside of the, uh, the out of line activity I was partaking in with, with particular people out there, shout out to them might be watching uh that i didn't really see much of australia you know like you go yeah, to melbourne right, right. i'm like no i stayed in sydney i had a sick place i stayed there i went to some clubs i went to some uh, out of line you know place i don't know some places and yeah. that, that was all i did i didn't really see australia i went to the and, Bondi beach one time so it's yeah thing that you did unique to australia right even the extracurriculars is right. all something that you could have did in the middle of nowhere iowa you know it's like you didn't actually necessarily embark on the fact that you were in australia you were just in a different locale where you were being a 20 something trying to be successful right i mean that's pretty much exactly it and, and that's you, sort of you had you had direction which is very unfair because these people he's speaking to don't most 20 somethings have no fucking clue what they're going to do mm -hmm. and it's very unfair to say choose now put your nose to the grindstone and follow that path so that when you're 30 something you can sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, I guess that, that is his message too. You know, he sort of stays on point. He stays on what his message is and what he kind of has the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. So, and I think about that a lot too is, you know, when people talk like how do you get successful at poker, to me, get successful at poker by just putting a lot of work, putting a lot of effort in many different, I mean, when you think about it, it's got to be many different areas, but just consistently doing it and, mm -hmm. and keeping at it and dealing with that adversity that's going to come along many, many times. But I mean, I, I don't really know how to, I don't necessarily want to recommend people do it the same way I did it because like you, you pretty much, you sacrifice a lot of things along that path. And I don't think it's the only way to be successful at poker, but it's also the only way I know how to be successful at poker. So I don't necessarily even know how to answer that question. Sometimes people, because on one hand, I know how I did it, but I don't necessarily want to tell someone they do it because I feel like oftentimes it's not going to take them down the necessarily best path. So it's a question I always get that I don't always know exactly what should be the answer. Well, like much like anything else in life, the answer lies somewhere in the middle, right? Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest anyone goes my path either where you go broke 16 times. I mean, it's funny because like technically I never had zero dollars to my name, but like you're functionally broke and I was functionally broke every other month. It seemed like, you know, it's, it's, you'd run it up, you'd run it down, whatever, but it was all part of the learning process. I wouldn't necessarily suggest that to somebody either, but you know, the takeaway from a lot of that was invaluable. It, it was worth every dollar that I spent. So somewhere in between those two extremes lies the proper pathway. It's just impossible to really steer somebody down it. So I don't fault Gary Vee for doing what he does. It's what he knows. So the people that are going to gravitate to him are going to gravitate to him. The people who are going to gravitate to my side are going to gravitate to my side. But like, I don't even believe in my side. I believe in something in the middle for sure. I just, I, I would always err on the side of freedom. I would never, the whole purpose of being entrepreneurial and, and taking on this difficult path that others are unwilling to take is the independence that it provides. That's why we all play poker. It's not for the riches. It's for the independent lifestyle, right? And somewhere along the line, a lot of people become slaves to the dependency of, of making money. For sure. I mean, I guess everyone wants to, feels like that's what they need to do to survive. And mm -hmm. all, all, some people I talk to, they feel like all they know how to do is play poker. And you say, well, what else can I do to make this amount of money? I mean, I don't know the answer for you. It's going to be different for everyone. And it might take some time to get to that point. So, I mean, I can understand how people do become dependent on that. And it sort of changes from this to that. And I mean, do you feel like you take advantage of that quite well in terms of being able to have the freedom and have the independency to do whatever you'd like to do? Or do you still feel like you're, you're still pretty much, I don't know, dependent in some ways? Uh, I, I feel like that's one area that I've been very fortunate to be relatively independent the whole way along. Um, and I think a lot of it's just how hard I was striving to make it in baseball. So I was so dependent on making it in baseball that... I didn't even recognize the transition into poker. I was traveling to all these tryouts 
and winning thousands of dollars while doing so. <laughs> so like I was relinquishing my dependency through this transition into poker. And then once I did finally fully tra transition and kind of give up on the dream, uh, I realized that I was back at square one and didn't know shit about shit. So the best thing that I could do is whatever the hell I wanted, right? Like just, I've been in such a stringent boundary type lifestyle for so long. The best thing I can do is just remove boundaries and figure out where I sink and swim. And you know, that, that process has just been basically what's allowed me to evolve into whatever the hell I am now. So what's next after Super High Roller Bowl? Where are you putting your, your focus on the cash games for the series, uh, tournaments for the series, go into the, the academy? What, what are you, you going to be focusing on? So that's kind of the, the beauty and the curse of it all is uh, I never am really able to say. Um, the, the second I win the Super High Roller Bowl, I'm hopping a flight home for my nephew's graduation. Uh, he's graduating high school this year. I wouldn't miss it for the world. So I'm missing the 100K for sure. Uh, after that, um, assuming I have the funds and the invites, I'm going to play as much cash as I possibly can. Mm. Um, and that's all very gray right now. Uh, I need to speak with with my fundees as well as you know maybe win $6 million to help cushion it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get back into the cash games as soon as possible. If that's not a possibility, which has been the case for like the last two summers where I just didn't get any invites at all, um, I'm going to play full schedule. Like that, I wholeheartedly is within my control. Um, I'm going to play every open no limit event I can get my hands on. I'm going to win a goddamn bracelet one of these days. Uh, and after that, uh, road trip. My nephew's going to college next year. Um, Maybe he might take a gap year. He's not sure, but uh, I want to spend some time with him before he goes. So we're going to do an RV trip uh, all through the West Coast, hitting all the national parks and stuff, do some camping, um, maybe do a little bit of filming along the way. Uh, we're going to iron his life out. You know, he's considering a gap year uh, where if he were to take it, um, I would probably move him out here for the year and show him the inner workings of the business, have him be uh, work under me a little bit. And uh, he actually wants to develop a podcast. Uh, he was going to do it his senior year of high school, and I really wish he would have been able to. He was just too busy with sports and stuff. But he wanted to do a pod on the transition from high school to college and basically help people through that because it's a lot for an 18-year-old, man. Like the financial aid process, choosing a school, like choosing a career path. 18-year-olds don't know that stuff. And right. he had to lean on a lot of people along the way, and he still only arrived at a point where – he's down to his final three schools or a gap year and still doesn't necessarily have an answer. Um, so if he chooses the gap year, I would force him to be a bit in the workforce where, all right, you're going to, you're going to create this thing and we're going to make it big and you're going to spend a year on it. And then after that, you're going to decide what the hell you want to do. So by the time you reach the end of this podcast, you're going to have an answer for people. Um, and that would encourage me to travel more. I'd hit Europe for the first time. I would, you know, see the sites a little bit, if you will, and make sure that he, was taking them in as an 18 year old rather than as somebody on the grind. Mm. Well, sounds like you got quite the adventure coming up here over the next bunch of months. Yeah. Lot to I love do. The summer. Man, I love the summer. It's the best. Lot to do out there. Well, I guess we'll be we probably have the victory podcast, of course, after you win the Royal Bowl. We'll have that sometime when you get back from Pittsburgh, of course, because, Perfect. you know, I mean, you got to have the victory podcast and yeah. I mean, people. I'm excited. I'm, I'm more excited now, man. I don't know. You got me. But I'm. I'm thinking you're gonna. I mean, I don't know, man. Can I, can I say that? I think you're gonna win. Can I say that? Can I say that confidently? I'm saying it confidently. Yeah. I'm picking. I'm picking Berkey to win. I'm taking. I'll call my shot on your pod. I don't give a shit. I don't care if I bust fifty sixth instead. I'm calling my shot. I'm. I'm final tabling this thing for sure. And uh, top three. Feel, oh man, I just feel it in my bones. So I, I've been trying to hold this off for a couple more minutes, but there's a small chance we could have hit outside of the Drunken Fader podcast, which some people may or may not count because it was completely fucking out of line in, um, in PCA. This might be the, long, the longest pod I think I've done. I, I'm trying to, to look here by length. If someone can tell me if that's true, because we're at, I think we're at 319 right now, which I believe either Sauce, the first one's 320, or the Hollywood Haxton one might be might be one of the longest ones, but there, there I think this this could be this could be a new non-drinking live record for for longest podcast here. Yes, 
so hack since 323 oh my god we gotta go four more minutes man i mean hey we're right we're right along that right along that edge here yeah hollywood hackson was 323 sauce was three sauce was uh at the three hour and 17 mark yeah man, anybody who stuck around this long like god bless you i it's, i don't know how you did it yeah some people say it's at two it's only because youtube tracks it at two it's definitely not at two but if you are watching this and you are watching this back and you get to this part. I always say this: hit us up on Twitter. Tell us what your favorite part was at Joinger One or at Berkey Eleven. Tell us what you liked. What why you watched this long? What the fuck are you thinking? How is it possible? Just hit us up. Let us know what you like. What you didn't like. I guess don't what you didn't. I don't know if you didn't like it. Why the fuck are you watching this long? But <laughs> if you're listening to it on iTunes or SoundCloud or whatever. Get in touch with us. Let us know. I, I I know I'll be happy to hear about it. I still get messages from the Fedor podcast, which was a year and a half ago now. So. I watched a lot of that pod. I, man, he's such an interesting human being. Um, yeah. But yeah, honestly, like I, I think that you provide a real avenue for, I don't know, like I think that that's something that poker opens itself up to is like more of the Gary V, Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan type interactions where uh, you take long form like this and condense it down into short form and give people digestible bites of some really valid points that might be made, you know? It's like you've had some amazing guests on along the way. Like, I'll watch any two-minute clip you put out with Perkins. I don't care what it's about. I'll watch it, right? And if it's bad, I just won't re-watch it, but I'll definitely watch it the first time around. Like, let me hear that guy talk. And I think that, you know, there's just tons and tons of those guys who are just open to dropping nuggets of what they've learned along the path. And that's really, really interesting to people. And I'm not saying that, you know, suddenly you or I or any of these guests that you've had on are just going to become the next Gary V. But it's like there's a soft spot in the market for that for sure, where the two minute poker content people are digesting isn't just some stupid fucking hand. It isn't, now granted, this is one of my favorite hands of all time, but it isn't just Robo beating uh, Patrick Antonius in four runs oh, in PLO. Oh. Oh, what a great hand. Oh, my Man, God. I, I literally bring it up to him probably once a month when I see him. It's just, I can't get enough of Antonio's just saying, like, Sammy Farha, just do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great hand. Oh, that's a great hand. Ace but yeah, it's like, you know, somewhere along the line, we got to get away from the glitz and glamour of just seeing cards being turned over and having percentages up in the corner as, as to who's going to win what and how much money is going to change hands. It's like, it's it's the pretty girl. Like, we're beyond it. We're not a beer company trying to sell you Budweiser anymore or, or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. we're trying to be an intellectual community, yet we're not leaning on that. And it seems very foolish. Yeah, I think one thing I could do better of is is putting out more, and this is something I was just bringing up again and something I've always thought about and people always talk about, and I've done a little bit of it, is just the micro content, as you mentioned, putting out those sort of taking things that are three hours and then putting them into two to five to seven minute clips that people who don't want to sit down for two hours, one hour, whatever, can digest through and then still get to know these people a bit better. And honestly, there's, I, this is probably something you should do from the start, but at the same time, just hasn't been something I've done. And I, I do sort of enjoy the exclusivity you maybe some people yeah. get when they get to watch the entire thing. I think that's like- I, I, think, I think that process falls more on us as guests, right? Like if I, if I think there's something usable from here, I should ask you permission and go through and like chop up a few clips. But I think like what you can do that's interesting for you as a brand and product is find similar like overlapping subject matter, maybe something that you've talked about with all the guests and now take one or two minute sound bites from each of them and end up with like a 30 minute clip. Right. And it's like, I'll fucking watch that start to finish. And you could probably do it over a myriad of topics, um, even if they're just like loosely related, right? But hearing a bunch of really intelligent people talk about the process, whatever the process may be, is always going to be interesting and insightful to those who aren't firsthand involved. Yeah, I think that was kind of the big thinking about starting the podcast and, and doing it the way I've done it is that it stays away from, it sort of like shines light on these other topics that aren't often discussed that I think are super interesting and fascinating and tell a lot about what it takes to become a successful poker player and sort of try to focus the conversations on those things because I don't think they're often discussed. And I think they're often not discussed because you don't really understand them unless you become a successful poker player yourself. So there's certain topics and, and ideas you could get into and talk about 
that are completely unique from from like my perspective whereas a lot of other people just can't because they don't really like you don't know it until you are in there until you're fucking 10 million hands in or five million hands in or two million you had the success you go with the ups to go through the downs the adversity the feelings of doubt and all these type of things that you experience and then finally breaking through to have the success and then trying to maintain that point at the top or maintain the success in, in whatever success is to you i think you don't really know that until you go through it and that's and then that's just that's a unique thing you don't not many people have been able to do that in poker over time yeah and and being able to see like you know if you did like this highlight clip being able to see like 20 really successful people talk about similar things it's like that's powerful man yeah. and you know even if you only help one or two people along the way kind of find their find their path like that's meaningful i think um and you know i think the other thing that's kind of lost on people is this game is a game just like everything else and there are unfair advantages and fair advantages being afforded to everybody we're all given the same card distribution and the button the same amount of times but some of us are just like naturally better thinkers than others and it's no different than the professional athlete right barry bonds is much more gifted than uh the, the next guy who is fighting tooth and nail and scrapping but that doesn't mean that barry bonds doesn't need the intangibles as much as the next guy he just has an advancement in the game tree right like he doesn't have to worry about starting at the beginning of the maze and working his way through he naturally gets beyond the 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 barrier of entry and the learning curve itself and he's kind of like just thrust in the mi middle of it all um through like unquantifiable metrics kind of like what i was saying about uh Isildur and, and those guys they're just naturally good at certain things where they don't really have to justify or quantify it to themselves they just start like way advanced and then try to figure out from there and dissect things from there that doesn't mean that they're unable to be caught or it also doesn't mean that they don't have to study the game and grow the intangibles themselves if they want to be elite they're always going to have to be just as well-rounded as the guy who fought his way from the beginning so is Barry Bonds a metaphor and the steroids a metaphor for the dream machine that uh, some may or may not allegedly have at the high stakes online cash games or? Um, no, he's just my favorite player growing <laughs> up. Uh -huh. It was like a very, I was like, maybe it's a low key metaphor for the juice that some of the players on with dream machines online. I, I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess allegedly. I don't, I, allegedly. from what I know about the dream machine, it wouldn't take an elite player running it to still be good. Bang, bang. Whereas like, I think with bonds, bonds on or off steroids is still like a top 10 player of all time. Right. And that's not saying those who allegedly are running the dream machine aren't elite already, but it's like, if they pass that same software on to somebody who just barely knows how to play the game, they'd probably still be profitable. That's true. That's true. Where like you can give steroids to, you know, some guy in high school ball or, or D three college, and he's not suddenly going to become a pro. How much more did you enjoy the steroid era of baseball than compared to right now? Oh, uh, man. Um, I enjoyed it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and bonds being a big part of it. If, if, I didn't, if I wasn't so emotionally invested in somebody that was at the forefront of it, I would probably be a lot more of a traditionalist, like wagging my finger saying, you fucking guys cheated. But I'm really glad that I was emotionally invested in somebody because it allowed me to form a bias that eventually allowed me to become a lot more objective where like today I kind of understand that, um, you know, it's, it's not the black and white portrayal of cheating that, that people made it seem like it was, it was probably largely a, an even playing field. Pitchers were doing it. Hitters were doing it. Like, I don't really think it was, you know, 10% of guys are out there, creating this massive edge for themselves and the other 90 are suffering. Um, moreover, the science just continues to evolve. So like, as we get into like optimal living and uh, biohacking and things like that, um, something like HGH, which was largely uh, kind of painted into a negative uh, corner with steroids is now kind of evolving to something that I think somewhere along the lines will be used the way we use protein now. Like they're finding very, very few adverse effects, if any, um, and just a wealth of positive effects. And the only reason it has such a negative connotation is because people stacked it with steroids and testosterone, which are synthetic, right? But like HGH is, is naturally created in the body and it has a lot of uh, positive benefits when removed from those synthetics. And, I guess like 
I'm glad it all came to be because it's advanced a lot of this, these sciences. Uh, shining a national spotlight on it, I think, forced people to take a closer look. And I think we're further along the learning path now. Like, I don't necessarily know that biohacking would be as much of a thing now uh, had the steroids era not not come to light. Hmm. I don't think I've actually heard somebody say that. HGH is that a secret, kid? Is that was that what is that how you do it? Not yet. Uh, I've been trying my damnedest. Um, I, I if if I had known then what I like, if I had known at eighteen what I know now, I wouldn't have even hesitated. I mm. I would have found a way to to get on HGH, but it wouldn't have been as helpful then either, right? Like it's more of a means of uh, of reversing the effects of aging. So like at eighteen, if you take HGH, I don't really think it would do much for you. Um, but like at forty five, it it would help you recover. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually suffered for a long time of like low T. So I went through a period uh, between like 30 and 34 where I just couldn't get my testosterone levels to recover and they wanted to do synthetic test therapy and I just refused to do it. That's why I know so much about HGH because I've been researching it pretty much for five years and trying to figure out like the best pathway to naturally um, improving my T. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to do a lot of it through diet. So I, I was like 140, which if you don't know much about testosterone levels, the average 30 year old is probably in the six, six or seven hundreds. Um, and I was able to just through diet exercise, a lot of like small tweaks that way, get it into like the 400 range, which is now considered to be, you know, normal by, by testing measures, but still likely below average for my age group. How old are you? Are you 35 right now? Or are you older than that? Yeah, I'm 35. 35. How, what's your, uh, how tall are you? Cause you seem, you seem very tall. No, I'm not. I just have good posture. Uh, I'm six foot. You're six foot. Are you fucking yeah. kidding? Dude, listen, dude, if you were like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one guess. You guess my height. I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. I would, I would never, I would six foot would have been the last, I don't know. Am I seeing things? I feel like you're like six foot six. Like two sixty five or some shit like that. No, man. You look uh, like J Jane Andes, man. You guys look the same to me. The the crazy thing is too, I'm six foot and my inseam is only thirty. Like I have really short, thick. I'm a pitcher, man. Like I'm just all thigh. Uh, but I actually have like a relatively long torso and long arms for a guy my height. Maybe that. Uh, I don't know what. I mean, like, like I don't know. <laughs> <It's crazy shit. laughs> I'm, I'm like very, body. I'm very postured, and I have like broad shoulders, and again, I have a long torso. So I think like sitting down, it makes me appear a lot taller than I am. Mm. I'm from pictures I, too. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What I'm thinking, man. I'm crazy. I mean, I'm telling you, I was. I, we could have made a bet. I'm saying I would have lost, <laughs> lost a lot of money. No way I would ever put put it to that side. Let's let's put it like that. So that's fair. Uh, I think we actually did. Okay. Well, one more question. Fine. Poppy, ask him what's his opinion on Kate Hall. I feel like he would have an interesting answer. Um. I don't know Kate that well. I know her indirectly through Dan. Uh, I'm probably not going to give you like the answer that you're looking for. Yeah, I, 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 was gonna say, I, I could have seen that. I could expect. That. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, I have a ton of respect for anybody who speaks their mind. Like I don't always agree with her opinion, and I think that she often is more polarizing than she needs to be. Um, but I also think that's kind of a byproduct of her social persona and the fact that she almost gets goaded into that polarization, right? Like there's literally no room for her to ever contradict herself or any of her ideas. So if she's processing through something like uh, thought wise, and this is probably particularly true of poker since she's relatively new to the industry. Um, if she's working through that learning process and she's openly speaking about it as she goes through it, eventually she's going to run into a contradiction. And now she's lost the ability to publicly speak on it because there are so many people out on a witch hunt to kind of condemn her and destroy her and just point their fingers and say like, you're a fake, you're a farce. Uh, it, it's It's gotta be really mentally taxing on her, man. I, I really don't know how she does it. Uh, I personally love being polarizing myself. I love taking hard stances on things. I love being contrarian, but uh, I know that you have to kind of do it with a filter where you have to be really well versed in something before you start speaking ideas on it. I mean, this is the first I've started speaking openly about like biohacking and nutrition and stuff like that. It's because I feel like I'm finally well versed enough to understand that I don't know anything. Whereas like three years ago, I would have like definitively told you that 
this type of fat was good and this type of fat was bad only to find out that the science is actually pretty new and down down the line i was i was disproven mm. um you know i put my foot in my mouth enough times where I, I understand that's not to be true and it's better to just lead with the the perception of the way i understand it is and that may be very flawed so if it is please feel free to direct me in a better better way well i'm sure if anyone out there is listening to you they're going to direct you in some way if they got a if they got an issue with anything you've sent, I'm sure HDH, that HDH thing, you might get some some links sent your way. I could definitely see it or someone leaving it in the comments. Yeah, so. I'm cool with it. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as like learning more about that, I would defer to Tim, Tim Ferriss. He brings on like the best in the business. And a lot of what I was actually just referring to, uh, man, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was uh, a chemist for Belco. And he's the one who created androgystine, the the AD that uh, one AD that uh, McGuire was taking, um, as well as a bunch of other formulas. And he's just like this twisted biochemist who's like done a ton of shit and probably done a ton of damage to his body along the way because he just guinea pigged himself the whole fucking time. It's, it's so, Patrick Arnold. Yes, it's yeah. Patrick Arnold. Correct. And he's a psychopath. But man, is he a good listen? <laughs> Put it down, Jonah. We got to listen to this one, man. This like one. <laughs> well, I think we've done it. I think we've officially hit a new non Fedor drunk, drinking drunk, out of line with my ex girlfriend somehow in the mixed uh, podcast. Here, so, <laughs> oh, man. I'm didn't, have even need, that part. didn't even need an ex girlfriend for this one. Just needed Jonah here, you know? So, hey, that's, uh, I appreciate the, uh, appreciate all the wisdom, my friend. I appreciate coming on the pod. It was a, it was a great discussion. I'm sure we'll be doing this again. Sooner than later, I'm sure people in the chat will have very good feedback and, and some nice things to say about it. Let us know what you thought. Hit us up on Twitter. I'm at join your one simple. Matt's at, at Berkey eleven B E R K E Y eleven and Instagram too. You on IG? You do more? You do a lot of IG and are you you sort of not? I, I dabble. I'm I'm trying to find my my photographic eye. I guess uh, we throw a little bit up there when we can. Well, I'm on IG pretty much. Uh, I just started like two, two and a half months ago. So I'm, we're doing a lot of stuff on there. Okay. I'm at Poppy GTO. Jonah somehow has his goddamn first name. He's at Jonah. If you want to follow Jonah because he, he worked the Jonah shuffle and, and acquired his name recently. Don't ask Strong. him how. Yeah, I know. So I said, we woke up one morning. He's like at 3 a.m. He's like, I got an idea. I said, okay. Starts going on. The, starts doing the idea. Next morning wakes up. He's like, I got an email. I said, what's the email said? He's like, oh my, he's like shocked. He's like, dude, check this out. My, I changed, my name's changed at, he's like, he lives like the, I've never seen someone so happy in my entire life. He got his name changed at Jonah. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, I don't know, man. It was, it was psyched to see a 21 year old with a gleam in his eye like that. Yeah, it's great. They haven't been beaten down by life yet. You know, it's a really a beautiful thing. <laughs> so I said, man, I'm like, man, I fucking, I was like, man, I didn't know what to think about it. I'm like, I'm excited for you, but at the same time, like, <laughs> that's great. Oh, uh, well, guys in the chat, appreciate y'all tuning in. Much love, guys. Be back tomorrow. Behemuthan. Matt, you can follow along with Matt's new show on Poker Central's new thing, Poker Go. Uh, promo code S4. Four. Solve for four. life. Solve for Y. S4. It's like a tongue twister, bro. Solve, <laughs> solve for Y. S4. Y. W. No, Y. y. Oh, why was W? Why W is solve for Y Academy? It's W. Yeah, but, but you pronounce Y Y. Solve for Y. Okay, S for W. Okay, yeah. so S no for S for w. Y. S for Y. I don't. I'm telling you, I can't get this down, man. I'm thinking, but honestly, <laughs> Sam, Sam, Sam proved himself right. It's it's too difficult to audibly say because it could be a myriad of things. But it's the letter S, the number four, and the letter Y. So it's a a. a so it's a num a number a letter a letter a number and then another letter okay s4y yeah. perfect s4y promo code we're just getting into more airtime here uh, for anyone <laughs> watching this long and super horribles next sunday we'll be following along we're excited to see what happens matt take care of my friend everybody in the chat much love thank you so much for the platform man appreciate it no problem man great time and uh like i said man we'll definitely have to do it again soon maybe we're out in vegas man i don't know if you're i mean you'll be grinding yeah. it full series here so you're gonna be uh you're going to be certainly tired as fuck. So come over sometime. We'll, uh, we'll hit the lab. Definitely, man. We'll be, we'll be for sure visiting this summer. So take care, Matt cool. and everybody else. See you later. Adios. Much love guys.